On the day the gates opened the world fell into chaos, countless monsters poured out of the gates and began destroying civilization as we know it. Dragons with the ability to shoot laser beams from their mouths, orcs that could shatter the ground with ease, and other various monsters made humanity their playthings. Of the countless humans who were helplessly dying to these unknown monsters, a select few were lucky enough to awaken supernatural abilities. They became known as the saviors of humanity, or hunters. One of these hunters, Lee Hyunwook, is an F-rank player known as the Great Steel Emperor, and he was called humanity's last hope, however Lee believed his life has been royally fucked. The Ant, short for Anti-Monster Troop, is a place that hunters who have awakened are forced to serve, and in this place we see a team of soldiers getting disciplined. They had their heads on the ground and their ass in the air. One of these soldiers was Lee, who was questioning why he was in this position when he was humanity's last hope. They were in the shooting range, and the commanding officer shouted at them saying they were the strongest. He proceeded to scold them for losing track of nine cartridges. As the commanding officer went on Lee sneakily activated his power and he made a bullet case fall out of his pockets. He proceeded to use the power to bring the bullet case close to his mouth, and he ate it. The commanding officer asked the soldiers if they were in their right minds, and they all replied saying no. A notification appeared in front of Lee, informing him that he has 300 grams of metal currently available for manipulation. Lee stared at the message, and he thought about what the commanding officer said. He wondered how anyone would be in their right mind if this was their second time serving in the army. In his previous life right before he regressed Lee was crushed by the debris of a building, and while he laid there a person approached him. Lee looked around, seeing the destroyed buildings and the countless corpses that covered the ground. He smiled saying in the end it wasn't monsters that killed humanity, but hunters. The person that was approaching was surprised to see Lee on the ground. He called Lee by his name, and said he was wrong. He told Lee that the divine creatures such as themselves have just judged humanity. Lee scoffed at the person. He told him that they weren't divine creatures. They were just villains, humans who sold their soul to the devil and began massacring their own kind. He says if he had known how to grow stronger a year, no even a day earlier he would have been able to kill the so-called divine creatures with ease. The person smiled, he asked Lee if he was frustrated, he told him not to be sad, and said even if Lee had known earlier someone as useless as him would have died either way. He called for a monster, and as he walked away he says this kind of death is fitting for an F rank like Lee. The monster lifted its weapon in the air, and as it struck Lee called the person's name, Gordon Pracy. Just like that Lee died, but he never expected that he would regress like in those man was he used to read. Another notification appeared on top of the one previously, the prompt congratulated him for realizing how to get stronger. The commanding officer told the soldiers that he would fix their rotten minds. He asked them to say soldier when he says one, and mindset when he says two. Lee greeted his teeth, he was fine with the fact that he returned to the past and lost all of his skills and stats. However, he hated the fact that he was in the army. Later that day another commanding officer was taking roll call of Lee's platoon. Lee was out of it. He still hadn't come to terms that he had to go through the military again. The commanding officer told Lee's platoon that they will be on standby since they needed to do something before they ate. Lee raised his hands and asked for permission to speak. The commanding officer granted him permission, and Lee says he and the other soldiers are tired because they just got back from training. The commanding officer smiled menacingly, and as he approached, Lee realized that he had forgotten about this commanding officer that was known as the army's garbage. The commanding officer Sanguk asked Lee if his squad should do the work instead. He tapped Lee's helmet and said they are just F rank who can't level up, so they should take on more work to compensate for their lack of talent. Sanguk asked Lee if his platoon would take responsibility if something urgent happens while they are working. This scene was beginning to gather a lot of attention and there were some soldiers who agreed with what Sanguk was saying, and some who thought he was being too rough. However Sanguk hadn't noticed the crowd, he asked Lee if he thought his platoon should have it easy just because they are corporals. Lee glared at Sanguk angrily, in his past life he never thought he would get past F rank, and he was beginning to wonder if he was this much of a loser back then. Sanguk noticed Lee glaring at him, and he asked Lee if he wanted to die. Lee remained silent so Sanguk began to activate his skill. He reminded Lee that he is at D rank. Lee sneered at Sanguk and said his platoon would do what he wanted, but they should at least give them some food. This further irritated Sanguk. But before he could retaliate, Lee asked him to look around. Sanguk looked around finally noticing the giant crowd that had formed because of his actions. Lee told Sanguk that the others might think he was being abusive, and he is worried he might get caught up in a weird rumor when he is supposed to be a great person in the future. Sanguk was puzzled because this isn't how he expected things to go, and with no other choice he agreed with Lee. Lee says since it was an order from him his platoon will eat real fast and then get the work done. 
With this, Sanguk dismissed Lee's platoon as they entered the dining hall to grab something to eat. Sanguk addressed the crowd telling them to go eat. One of the soldiers was standing beside Lee. He was in shock because he never expected Lee to do something like this. Lee turned around and told the soldier, Park Jummo, to go eat. He says he doesn't feel like eating. Then he walked away. Sanguk was also left in a daze because it felt like Lee had changed overnight. Lee made his way to a secluded spot. He greeted his teeth and praised himself. He says what he just did is nothing compared to what the bastard did. While remembering Gordon Pracy, he greeted his teeth even harder and called him a son of a bitch. Another notification appeared informing Lee that the metal absorption is complete, and the weight of metal currently available for manipulation is 309 grams. He could now manipulate one more. Lee stared at the notification. If he stayed like this it was going to be hard to catch up to that bastard. He lifted his helmet revealing a bunch of metal spoons. The thought of him leveling up without the others knowing made him smile. Inside the dining hall these platoon members began to ask around for the spoons. They approached Private Park Junmo and informed him that all the spoons were missing. Junmo was shocked because he doesn't know who would steal spoons. Outside the dining hall Lee was busy devouring the spoons. But he still hadn't gotten used to the taste of steel. Another message appeared notifying Lee that metal absorption had begun. He had 13 minutes until the metal was absorbed, and the weight of metal he had available for manipulation is expected to increase by 1.25 grams. Lee took out a M7 bayonet. One M7 bayonet is 140 grams, and if Lee wanted to add more weight on it for impact, he would only be able to control one of the combat knives. Cartridges are just 1 gram, and spoons are only 1.25 grams. At this rate it would take too long for him to catch up to where he was before he regressed. Lee wondered if he had no other option but to continue eating cartridge and spoons. He looked up at one of the towers guessing that he will have to prepare for a gate that will appear in 3 days, because his goal is to kill a boss monster even though he is only level 1. He infused his mana into the combat knife, and he began to manipulate it. He was determined to show what it means to be an expert. Three days later at the 3rd Brigade 1st Battalion Station Namsen 5th Post, Lee and Junmo were on guard together. Junmo told Lee that he had changed recently. Lee looked at his watch checking the time. He asked Junmo if his recent change is making him uncomfortable. Junmo said no, however Lee was not paying attention. He was focused on a message that had appeared. Lee's metal absorption was complete, he could now manipulate 6 grams more, and the total weight of metal currently available for manipulation was over 1,000. Junmo told Lee that what he meant was that he has changed for the better, Lee turned around and began approaching Junmo. This put Junmo on the defensive and he asked Lee why he was approaching him all of the sudden. Lee stared at Junmo, and he asked him if he trusted him. Junmo told Lee that he trusted him, however Lee wondered how true that is. Later near the soldiers' sleeping quarters, a gate opened and goblins began pouring out. The goblins observed the sleeping quarters from a cliff and they prepared to launch an attack. However the one that would lead the attack was quickly struck down by a combat knife that was being manipulated by Lee. Lee couldn't stop smiling. He was so happy to see the goblins after having to wait three whole days. The goblin that Lee struck down was greatly injured but it wasn't dead. The goblin used its blade for help and began to stand up. Lee was shocked. This was his first time failing an ambush and he blamed it on the fact that he is level 1. He began to infuse his mana into the combat knife. He says to the goblin that this was his second chance at life, and he really doesn't like doing the same work twice. The goblin quickly recovered from Lee's attack, and it rushed at him. Lee told the goblin that if it dropped anything shitty it would be dead to him for real and he proceeded to cut the goblin's head clean off. This angered the other goblins. The dead goblin dropped something that piqued Lee's interest. He used his manipulation ability and he picked the red crystal that the goblin dropped, and he brought it to his mouth. The goblins were confused and they stared at Lee like they had just seen a madman. Lee began to eat the crystal, it was disgusting, and he began to recall the stinky taste that Mana Steel had. A message appeared congratulating Lee for consuming Mana Steel, a metal of the other world. Lee knows the future and he needs to eat steel to grow stronger. This means if he eats everything he comes across from now on it would be like living life on easy difficulty. He turned around and smiled at the goblins that were just waiting to make him stronger. The goblins got nervous because they had never seen a human eat a monster's core. This made them hesitant to attack. Lee infused his mana into the combat knife again, and he began to manipulate it. It was time for him to start. Previously, before Lee went to the gate's location, he covered Junmo's mouth and he asked him to speak quietly. He told Junmo that he could sense that metals are moving. This shocked Junmo, and he whispered to Lee saying he thought Lee could only sense metal he could see. He asked Lee if he could sense metal that he couldn't see as well. Of course this was a lie but Junmo doesn't know that. Junmo told Lee that if his powers got better he should report it. 
Li refused, and he told Junmo that the higher-ups wouldn't believe him if he says he could sense gates that couldn't be seen by modern devices. Puzzled, Junmo asked Li if he had a plan. Li grabbed the back of Junmo's neck and he stared at him intensely. He asked Junmo to promise him one thing. He told Junmo that he was going to check it out, but he wanted Junmo to stay at the post and promised that he would never report this to the higher-ups. The reason why Li wanted Junmo to make this promise is because if the military found out they would take all the weapons for themselves. Back to the battle both Li and the goblins began to charge at each other. The goblins were first to strike. However Lee was able to dodge their attack, he rolled on the ground and used the combat knife to cut the heels of the goblins, immobilizing them, the goblins began to cry out in pain. On top of a tree what looked like the chief of the goblins watched angrily as Lee was cutting down the other goblins. Lee didn't kill the goblins, he left them alive because he wanted them to continue screaming. He became distracted and a goblin was able to sneak up on him. The goblin was about to strike Lee with its blade however Lee quickly noticed. He infused his mana into one of the immobilized goblin's blade and he parried the goblin's strike disarming it in the process. While the goblin was disarmed he proceeded to cut its throat so the others could watch. His goal of maximizing their fear was working. The goblin's mana steel dropped and rolled next to Lee's feet. Lee addressed the goblins. He says that he died in his previous life because he was hit from behind, so how dare they try attacking him from behind. He told the goblins that if one more bastard attacks him from behind he would eat that bastard alive. The goblins froze in place because of fear and Lee stopped attacking them believing that this was enough. He was wondering if he should get started with the main course now, even though he knows it's frustrating to find what he was looking for with his eyes. He began to scan the location for the cunning boss monster, the goblin shaman. Lee purposefully lets his guard down, because he knows the goblin shaman won't miss its chance because it's not as stupid as the other goblins. And Lee was correct. The goblin shaman took one of the things it had tied around its neck, and it began to chant a spell. Lee started sensing the goblin shaman's mana and he smiled menacingly because his prey was here. The goblin shaman used the earth spike skill, and giant spike pillars shot up from the ground Lee was standing on. The attack took out some of the other goblins, and Lee disappeared. At one of the posts a soldier woke his platoon leader informing him that the ground just shook. The platoon leader angrily asked the soldier if he was scared. He told the soldier that if he woke him up again for something so meaningless he would kill him. Back at the gate the goblin shaman started laughing because it believed Lee was dead. However to its surprise it heard Lee's voice saying he found its location. Using a goblin's blade Lee attacked the goblin shaman but it was able to dodge. Lee acted disappointed saying the goblin shaman ruined his perfect shot. The goblin shaman started laughing, believing that it ruined Lee's sneak attack. Lee smiled saying the goblin shaman is a dumbass for believing his acting. Lee revealed his real attack and sent the combat knife aiming for the goblin shaman's head. However the goblin shaman managed to catch Lee's knife, Lee was surprised, he couldn't believe the goblin shaman would be able to catch his combat knife, he smiled saying it seemed like he really was a failure in the past. The goblin shaman angrily stared at Lee, Lee told the goblin that it shouldn't be angry about a small scratch when he sent a huge gang of goblins to attack. He asked the goblin shaman to come down so he could slice it up in one go. This was a bluff, he turned around questioning what he should do about the other goblins. Since the boss, who was hiding, is now fighting him head on, the other goblins were in high spirits now. A prompt appeared telling Lee to be cautious, because he consumed mana rapidly in a short amount of time. His mana reserves were below 40%. Lee realized that this was a big problem, and since it comes to this he has no other choice. He removed the safety from his gun saying if he can't eat the goblin shaman then they should die together, and even if it takes a long time. He promised that in the end he was going to eat the goblin shaman. Their battle was interrupted by Junmo who was close by calling for Lee. The goblin shaman quickly ordered the other goblins to attack Junmo. Seeing the goblins rushing at him, Junmo was frozen in place due to fear, and as he was about to be struck down by a goblin Lee called out to him telling him to get down. Junmo quickly ducked and covered his head, and Lee opened fire on the goblin. The goblin was pushed back but the bullets had no effect. Lee manipulated one of the goblin's blades on the floor and attacked the goblin with it. But the goblin easily blocked the blade. The goblin opened its mouth widely and it started laughing. But it shouldn't have done this because Lee jumped at him and placed the barrel of his gun in the goblin's mouth and he opened fire. After dealing with the goblin Lee quickly turned around and he pointed his gun at the other goblins however they were gone. This angered Lee because he missed his opportunity and he never expected the goblin shaman to be so cautious. Another platoon leader radioed in, asking each post for a report since he heard gunfire. Lee quickly reported that a gate had appeared in the area. He told the other platoon leader that the monsters are goblins and that they left the area after the first skirmish. He also reported that there were no casualties in his post. An order was given from the higher-ups for Lee's post to be on standby to defend their post. 
Lee quickly realized that she would be arriving soon, in some building a red-haired woman, and a couple of soldiers quickly got ready to respond to the gate opening. This lady is the ant's paladin, and her name is Seo Yunha, and when she arrives at the location, Lee knows she will stop the gate like she did in his previous life, and the military will take all the weapons, and the legendary item, adamantium, that dropped in his previous life would also be taken by the military. This legendary item was the ultimate item that made people call him the Steel Emperor. If he misses this chance to get it now, he won't get another chance for four years, and if that happens he will be at the same level as his previous life. This made him determined to get the adamantium first. However to do this he would need to clear the gate before the standby team arrives. Luckily he knows that if it's goblins they would need living human sacrifices. Genmo, who had passed out due to fear, woke up. He saw the goblin's corpse and screamed questioning what was happening. However Lee was too focused on tracking the goblins to notice the panicking Junmo. He wondered if the goblins would make their way to the city. But he quickly dismissed this thought because for goblins who hunt in packs, the population density is too high. The sixth post radioed and saying the goblins had arrived in their location. Lee smiled, and he radioed into the control team that his post will support the sixth post. The control team reminded him of the command that was given to his post, and they asked what F ranks would be able to do. Lee turned down the walkie-talkie and he began making his way to the sixth post. Junmo grabbed his leg saying he shouldn't go because this won't stop with him being confined to the guardhouse. What he was doing was enough for a military trial. Lee told Junmo that the sixth post is composed of an archer and a mage. They are long-ranged hunters and wouldn't be able to handle the goblins, so if they don't receive help quickly, it's likely they would die. Junwoo asked Lee if he thought going by himself would change anything, and Lee said he wasn't alone. He pointed at Junmo, saying he had him. Junmo looked confused so Lee asked if he didn't hear him correctly. At the sixth post one of the soldiers radioed into the control room informing them that they were in need of help. He says Corporal Kim Jeong is down. The control team informed them that the rapid response unit had departed, and they asked the six posts to defend their location with their lives. However, with the way things are going it seems the sixth post will be wiped out. The goblins were all over the six post building. Luckily Corporal Kim had acted quickly, and he casted a barrier over the building. The soldier with Corporal Kim asked Kim if he was okay. Kim was barely holding on to life. He told the soldier that the barrier he casted wouldn't last long. The soldier radioed into the control room again, asking if they planned on coming after the goblins finished them off. Suddenly all of the banging noise the goblins were making stopped. This confused the soldier and he looked around questioning why the goblins stopped attacking. Outside, the goblin shaman was casting the earth shot skill. After it finished chanting hundreds of boulders were shot at the six posts. Inside Kim and the soldier hung on for dear life. The soldier asked Kim if he knew what's happening now and Kim says the boss monster was attacking. He told the soldier that after the post is destroyed, it's likely the goblins will capture them and bring them to an altar, where they will harvest their hearts while they are still alive. Kim lifted the barrel of his gun and brought it close to his mouth. The soldier questioned what the corporal was doing, and Kim told the soldier that ending it now would be less painful than having the goblins rip his heart out. The soldier was brought to tears, it seemed like there was no way to avoid death. The goblin shaman started casting another earth shot skill, as it chanted its spell the soldier received good news. Lee radioed into the six post saying he would be assisting them from now on. He asked the soldier, Private Park, to load his crossbow, and when he did he should use his fire skill and aim at the light. This confused Private Park, so Lee repeated that he wanted Park to get his crossbow and take aim at the light. Park followed Lee's orders, he loaded his crossbow and began casting his fire skill, however he was still doubtful because he believed they would need a unit of archers at his level to be able to put up a fight. As he looked out he could see the boulders of the goblin shaman's skill forming. He remained focused but he couldn't see the light Lee wanted him to aim at. He radioed to Lee asking what he should be aiming for, suddenly he saw a light glowing in between the boulders. Lee had his flashlight on and he had a goblin by the chin with its neck exposed for a shot. His other hand was pointing in the direction of the sixth post. He told Park that all he has to do is take aim. He will be the one controlling the trigger. He did the motioning of pulling a trigger. And at the post Park was shocked because the trigger on his crossbow suddenly moved by itself. The shot was fired and at the last second Lee released the goblin and he jumped away. The goblin suddenly burst into flames, and Lee received a notification, informing him that he had consumed 1% of his mana. Lee looked at notification and smiled. With this strategy he could save his mana, and as a bonus he had access to Park's destructive archer abilities. All of the goblin's attention were turned to their burning comrade and they began to panic. Inside the post Kim stared at Park trying to grasp the situation. Park was still in shock because the shot actually hit. The goblin shaman noticed Lee and after it finished casting its skill it directed the attack at Lee. 
Lee quickly moved out of the way and he took cover in some bushes. He turned his flashlight off and disappeared into the darkness of the forest. The goblin shaman's attack had destroyed part of the forest. Park was dumbfounded. Lee snapped him out of it and told him to reload his crossbow and take aim again. All the goblin shaman could do was watch as Lee sneakily made his way around slowly wiping his army out. In some other part of the forest Junmo was going around questioning why Lee put a private like him in charge of finding a boss monster. And even if he could find the boss monster it's likely he would die after sending the signal. He made his way to the sixth post and he took cover in some bushes. He stopped searching for the boss monster because Lee was in the process of wiping out the other goblins. This left him confused because Lee made it sound like he would be buying time for the response team to get here. However from the scene it seemed like Lee was trying to clear the entire dungeon by himself. One of the goblins who was fleeing from Lee noticed Junmo hiding in the bushes. The goblin lifted its blade in the air and prepared to end Junmo. Junmo couldn't react in time. All he could do was hope Lee would save him. Luckily Lee quickly caught up to the fleeing goblin. He used his combat knife to deflect the goblin's blade. Then he turned on his flashlight and after Park took aim Lee shot the crossbow ending the goblin. He turned off his flashlight quickly and ran by Junmo, reminding him of the job he gave him to do. Junmo quickly grabbed his gun and he started his search for the boss monster again. But in the distance he could see as Lee was setting the goblins on fire, and he wondered if Lee really is the same person he knew. Lee continued to kill the goblins with his strategy. He was starting to wonder when the goblin shaman would reveal itself again. A notification appeared warning him that he is losing mana at a rapid rate, and his mana reserves were below 12%. Lee wondered if the goblin shaman is waiting for him to run out of mana. Suddenly he heard Junmo calling out to be saved again. Lee turned quickly and he began running in the direction of Junmo's voice. When arrived he saw the goblin shaman holding Junmo hostage. Junmo apologized saying he did his best to follow Lee's orders but in the end he was caught. Lee took out his combat knife and prepared to attack. The goblin shaman pointed its staff at Junmo's neck. It spoke in monster tongue, and even though Lee couldn't speak monster he knew what the goblin shaman was saying. He greeted his teeth then he dropped his weapon. Suddenly goblins who were hiding in the shadows appeared. Lee told Junmo that because of him it's checkmate. The goblins jumped at Lee to deliver the finishing strike. Lee smiled, he took control of Junmo's gun trigger and he blasted the goblin shaman greatly injuring it. The goblin shaman dropped Junmo and began to run away. Lee chased after it saying it's time to bon appetit. With his combat knife he struck the back of the goblin shaman, but his combat knife bounced off because the goblin shaman had leather armor covering its back. Another notification appeared informing Lee that he was quickly running out of mana, and his mana reserves were below 9%. Lee continued to chase after the goblin shaman questioning why the boss monster only covered its back with the leather armor, the goblin shaman ran back to the gate. Lee was close behind, and after seeing the gate Lee realized that if the goblin shaman entered he would lose his opportunity. The goblin shaman began to slowly make its way close to the gate laughing at Lee. Lee reached forth his hand pushing his body to the limit to reach the goblin shaman. The goblin shaman jumped at the gate, and as it entered Lee realized that its necklace was made of metal, with only 7% of his mana remaining. He manipulated the goblin shaman's necklace and pulled it back from the gate. Lee's mana dropped to 4%, the goblin shaman tried resisting. So Lee pulled him back with the chain again, and with 1% of his mana left he manipulated his combat knife and struck the goblin shaman's skull. The battle ended but Lee's mana reserves were at zero, and he was exhausted. While barely standing he complained about his body from the past and said he needs to put it through a workout. As he was standing there a skill called Holy Light was used in the air, Lee knew she was here. He quickly went to the goblin shaman's body and he began looking for the adamantium. He found it but the reserve soldiers also found the gate. They pointed their guns at Lee and told him not to move or they would open fire. Lee put the adamantium in his mouth and lifted his hands in the air. The soldiers asked Lee to identify himself. Lee quickly ate the adamantium, and he turned around and identified himself to the soldiers. Because of mana exhaustion Lee dropped to his knees. The soldiers quickly rushed over and they asked the support group to bring a stretcher for Lee. Seeing how the gate was still open means there are goblins still scattered around. So Siyuna ordered the other soldiers to spread out and look for the stragglers. Siyuna was confused by what she was seeing, and she questioned if four regular soldiers really took down a boss monster. All of the dead goblins and even the goblin shaman had similar wounds, and after further observation Siyuna concluded that this was the doing of one person. As the support team was taking Lee away with the stretcher Seo Yuna could hear him giggling. Lee received a notification congratulating him for consuming the legendary item Adamantium. But since a metal was already being absorbed the Adamantium absorption will be delayed. 
Lee did his best to cover his face so the other soldiers wouldn't see him smiling. Another notification appeared on top of the previous one, informing him that the metal he ate is enchanted, and after absorption he will develop magic skills similar to the enchantment. The expected weight increase the adamantium will give is undeterminable by the system, but the system predicted that the weight and mana boost would be leagues better than previously given for other metals. Seo Yuna watched Lee. She couldn't understand why he was laughing in this kind of situation. Lee received another notification. This one congratulated him because immediately after he consumed the adamantium, a rare ability was revealed. He could now detect all metals within his range of control. Lee was excited. He finally got the skill back. The control team radioed for Seo Yuna saying they found the runaway goblins and they were close to post 6. Seo Yuna and the other soldiers quickly rushed to post 6. And as they went Lee activated the ability and he could sense all of the metal weapons Seo Yuna and the soldiers were carrying. He lifted his arm in the air and smiled. Today was the day the Great Steel Emperor made his comeback. A few days later after the gate incident, we see two ladies making their way through the 3rd Brigade 1st Battalion station gossiping about the rumors that had spread about the gate. The lady informed her friend that apparently the F-rank rumor is true. Her friend dismissed this idea saying it's not possible. The lady told her that it was and said she heard it from the worker Aja she himself. She continued to explain that the other soldiers were just waiting to be killed. But suddenly an F-rank corporal appeared and with his combat knife he sliced up the goblins. The lady's friend questioned if it's possible for an F-rank to do something like this, and she asked her to stop living in a fantasy. In some place close by Sergeant Sanguk, a wizard and second squad commander, was questioning Private Park about the rumors. Park told him everything that happened that night but Sanguk asked Park if he wanted him to believe that bullshit. Park saluted him saying he is telling the truth. A giant of a man approached Park asking him to lower his voice. Park began to lower his hands saying he will rectify his rudeness right away. The giant of a man placed his hands on Park's shoulders and said Sanguk hasn't accepted his salute yet, and he proceeded to ask Park why he was lowering his hands. He grabbed Park by the ears, and Park quickly lifted his hands and began saluting again. He was sweating nervously, and he told the giant of a man that he didn't mean anything by it. Sanguk called the giant of a man, Wonsuk. The private Wonsuk was brought to attention, and Sanguk asked him if he could take three of the boys and raid a gate, since he had the power to rip goblins apart with his bare hands. Private Wonsuk is a barbarian that specializes in close combat. He is a D rank with the capability of outputting powers close to C rank. Wonsuk told Sanguk that what he just asked would be impossible. Park agreed, and said he didn't see the soldiers defeat the goblin shaman, so he guessed Lee just delivered the final blow. Sanguk thought this was plausible, but if by some fluke an F rank went wild and cleared a dungeon, then it will become an issue for the military's discipline, and he can't let it become an issue for military discipline. Wonsuk agreed and he smiled menacingly. Inside the battalion commander's office Lee reported in saying he came because he was told he had business in the commander's office. He was a little irritated because if the gate issue was cleared without any casualty then they should have just let him go. He wondered why he was called into the battalion commander's office. In the office with the battalion commander was Lieutenant Seo Yunha, a B-rank black paladin, and Lieutenant Lee Minhee, a C-rank wizard. The battalion commander, Lieutenant Major Kim Kangsyok, a B-rank druid with the nickname Namsons King of the Mountain asked Lee if it's true that he disobeyed the command to wait, and forcefully repelled the first round of the gate. Lee lowered his head, he knew if he said one wrong thing he would end up in military trial. He told himself to get a grip, and he started coming up with a plan that will land him in the guardhouse at most. Lee told Kangsyok that what he said was true, and he said he responded immediately while on duty and seized that gate's outbreak. Kangsyok told Lee that he read the reports but says he couldn't understand what he was reading. In a normal situation Lee, an F-rank soldier should have been ripped to shreds by the goblins. Lee could feel the incredible pressure in the room, and he knows if he steps back here his military life will be screwed. He told Kangsyok that he feels wronged. He elaborated further saying he feels as if the battalion commander has scammed him. Confused Kangsyok asked him what he meant. But before Lee could respond Lieutenant Minhee stepped in saying how dare an F-rank soldier say that to the battalion commander. Kang Siok stopped Minhee from saying more and he asked Lee to elaborate further. Lee told Kang Siok that there is something he emphasized every time he trained them, something he says without fail every single time. He asked Kang Siok if he remembers. Kang Siok remained silent and Lee repeated his own words to him. No matter how low your rank is, if you approach using the ant's great monster tactical textbook. Then even if you are D-rank no even E-rank you will be able to face a troll. Lee says according to Kangsyok's teaching even an F-rank like him should be able to take on a goblin. And although it's true he did go against the command of the control team. 
If he hadn't gone to support the 6th post all of the soldiers at the 6th post would have died. Li was impressed with himself for that response because he has attacked Kang Siok rationally. It was time to attack him emotionally. He repeated another one of Kang Siok's saying to him, For a true soldier there are no ranks, prepare for the worst and fight with all you have. Lee reminded Kang Siok that he also emphasized this during their training, and so like he said, as a true soldier would, under the battalion commander he respects. He took the tactics he learned after difficult training to heart and did his best to respond by carrying out the strategy with the other soldiers, and his life on the line. Lee continued saying the only reason he could endure his military life while being mocked and looked down upon for being an F rank was because of the true military mindset he felt from the battalion commander. So to see Kang Siok deny the results of that belief makes him feel like his entire military life has been denied and that is why he feels scammed by Kang Siok. Battalion Commander Kim Kang Siok, right around when he was appointed as the second lieutenant, a gate open. Orcs poured out of this gate and Kang Siok almost lost his life while fighting the orcs, but without a second thought or hesitation he returned to the army after receiving medical help and he became an early foundational member of the Amped. In other words Kang Siok is a soldier down to the bone. Lee lowered his head because he couldn't stop himself from smiling. He just told Kang Siok that he believed in his words, as his superior and put his life on the line for his fellow soldiers, so he believed there is no way Kang Siok would send him to military trial. Kang Siok approached Lee and he grabbed him by the shoulders saying he now understands. Kang Siok then asked Lee to become a non-commissioned officer. At the same moment Lee's metal absorption was completed and he gained the new skill Steel Physique. It was a D-rank skill that uses mana to temporarily strengthen a part of Lee's body. As the notification fired fireworks Lee stared at Kang Siok completely lost for words. Min He too was at a loss for words and Seo Yuna couldn't help but giggle. Kang Siok was so moved by what Lee said that he was brought to tears. He was certain he was making the correct decision. Lee started to sweat nervously by how Kang Siok was looking at him. It didn't seem like a joke, so he asked if he heard correctly, inside the 3rd Brigade 1st Battalion Station training room, while the other soldiers were sparring to better their skills. Lee was angrily doing some bench press, he re-racked the weight and sat up. While trying to avoid the guardhouse he managed to get himself into bigger trouble. While Lee was cooling down, Sanguk and Wonsuk looked over at him. Sanguk tapped Wonsuk on the chest signaling for him to start. Lee picked up his green towel and began wiping his face to go for a second round. He recalled Minnie telling Kang Siok that he can't make Lee a non-commissioned officer, since an F rank has never become a non-commissioned officer in AMP before. Lee was grateful to Minnie because he was able to gain some time by saying he will think about it thanks to him. He concluded that it's for the best that he live like a mouse for a while so he doesn't catch Kang Siok's eyes again. Suddenly Wonsuk appeared behind Lee's bench asking if he was done using it. Lee told Wonsuk that he wasn't but Wonsuk continued to lean on the weights. Lee turned around and asked Wonsuk what he was doing. Wonsuk picked up the weight Lee was using and he began to curl it. He said he thought if it was the person who is hot and famous these days, they would be using heavier weight. This scene caught the attention of Junmo and the other soldiers who were training. Lee looked over and he noticed Sanguk and his few friends laughing. Sanguk was mocking him by curling around some two-pound dumbbells. Lee quickly realized that Sanguk was the one who put Wonsuk up to this. And he knows that if he avoids him right now, he'll openly start to bully him like in his previous life. Lee was starting to get annoyed. An unavoidable situation where he has to show his power has appeared. When he just decided not to catch anyone's eye for the time being. He told Wonsuk that he had felt annoyed just now, so he came at the perfect time. Lee angrily turned his head and he asked Wonsuk to spar with him. Lee and Wonsuk made their way to the octagon, and every soldier in the training room stopped what they were doing and they gathered around the octagon. Lee and Wonsuk put their combat gloves on, and afterwards Wonsuk started licking his lips like a creep. He told Lee that he was about to teach him a lesson. Wonsuk quickly charged in and threw a left hook, Lee lifted his gloves and prepared to defend against the punch. Outside the training room a high-ranking officer was talking to one of the soldiers. The soldier informed the officer that the soldier named Choi Yeonjun went on vacation. This disappointed the officer. The officer told the soldier that he was excited since he heard Choi Yeonjun had the talent to be a sword saint, and he came because he wanted to see that talent with his own eyes. The soldier informed the officer that even though Sergeant Choi Yeonjun is the ace right now, there is another soldier who is called the future ace and he possesses the barbarian trait. Chin Myungho, the warrant officer and the tactical instructor for the ant's most elite special forces unit Black Tiger had his interest piqued. The soldier pointed at the training room and he informed Myungho that the future ace is currently sparring another soldier and said it would be a shame for Myungho to return empty-handed after coming all this way. Inside the training hall, Lee deflected Wonsuk's previous punch and he quickly took a step back. 
However, Wonsuk was relentless. He launched a fury of punches at Lee. Lee evaded every single punch, but he was quickly backed into a corner. With Lee in the corner, Wonsuk quickly rushed in and he threw another left hook. The crowd held their breath in anticipation expecting that Wonsuk had finished the fight with this punch. Junmo was in the crowd as well and he covered his eyes. Lee ducked, evading Wonsuk's punch, he proceeded to roll to the center of the octagon, and he taunt Wonsuk. Wonsuk was so irritated that the veins on his forehead began to show. The crowd got excited and most of them quietly laughed at the fact that Wonsuk was getting taunted by Lee. The soldier from earlier brought Myomho inside the training room and says the stage has been set up as if it were meant for an audition. The soldier asked Myomho if he thinks Wonsuk has a chance of becoming an ace. Myomho said he isn't sure yet, and he started watching the battle closely. The soldier talked up Wonsuk, saying all of his shots pack a punch. Myomho continued to watch the spar, and from what he could see Wonsuk couldn't land a single one of his punches. He asked for the point of having all that power when you can't even hit your opponents. The soldier laughed nervously. He told Myomho that Wonsuk is just inexperienced and said if he lands a proper punch, then the fight will be over in an instant. Suddenly Sanguk shouted for Wonsuk to get his act together, he says Wonsuk was going too easy on Lee. Sanguk's friends agreed, one of them shouted asking if Wonsuk thinks this is a joke, and another one says he bet money on him so he should take this more seriously. However Wonsuk wasn't going easy on Lee at all, in fact this entire time he had been trying to end the fight with a single blow, but his body felt heavier than usual. Wonsuk took a step forward and he threw another right hook, however Lee manipulated the eyelets on his boots causing him to misstep and miss his punch. Wonsuk hadn't noticed that Lee was controlling the eyelets on his boots to slow him down, and he began to wonder if there was something wrong with his body. Wonsuk launched another barrage of punches but none of them could hit their target, Lee smiled. He guessed that Wonsuk probably feels like he is fighting in a swamp. Lee began to advance and prepared to go on the offensive. Wonsuk quickly asked Lee to wait. He told Lee that his leg feels a bit weird. Lee smiled and taunted Wonsuk saying he wants to quit now since things weren't going his way. This further irritated Wonsuk and he called Lee and F rank scum. Suddenly Wonsuk's body started admitting steam. It was so strong that Lee was almost pushed back. This shocked Myomho and the other soldiers. After the steam cleared up Wonsuk had entered his body strengthening berserker mode. Lee knew he couldn't mess around anymore and quickly took a defensive stance. Myomho was excited. The fact that Wonsuk activated his body strengthening means this fight is no longer in the domain of sparring anymore. He was also surprised by Lee because his gaze didn't shake at all after seeing Wonsuk. But this made him more excited because this fight resembles a fight between an enraged buffalo and a leopard who has his fangs hidden. Myomho spoke out loud saying he is having fun watching the two spar. The soldier heard him and said he told him Wonsuk is no joke. Wonsuk was the first case the soldier had witnessed where a D-rank is capable of using a body strengthening technique. Back to the battle, Wonsuk told Lee that he is about to end things right here and now. Wonsuk moved so fast that it looked like he disappeared to the crowd, and when he appeared again Lee was sent flying with a punch. Sanguk praised Wonsuk, and their friends joined in saying Wonsuk is on a different level compared to Lee, which is why he is called the future ace. Inside the octagon, Wonsuk didn't use this opportunity to advance because his fist started hurting. He looked at his fist questioning why it feels like he just punched a steel wall barehanded. Lee had taken no damage from Wonsuk's attack, because he activated the D-rank skill he got earlier, strengthening body transformation, a skill that allows him to temporarily strengthen a part of his body, making it as hard as steel. Lee smiled menacingly, and he taunted Wonsuk, saying he got back at the big pig, so he should come at him. Wonsuk was blinded by rage, he told Lee that he is nothing more than a worthless F-rank, and he rushed in quickly and recklessly threw another punch. Lee swiftly evaded and he moved to the side of Wonsuk. He activated his body strengthening ability on his foot, and he kicked Wonsuk's calf. Wonsuk lost his balance and he fell to the ground. Lee felt using his new strengthening skill on a guy like Wonsuk is a waste but for fuckers like him, who act up because they're strong, the best cure is a beat down. Lee strengthened his fist, and he knocked Wonsuk to the floor with a powerful punch. While Wonsuk laid on the floor Lee proceeded to attack him with a barrage of powerful punches. The crowd was in shock. Myungho smiled, it seemed like Lee finally showed his fangs. And if this was in the animal kingdom then Lee has finally grabbed hold of the buffalo's neck. And if Lee is a real beast, there is no way he would let go of his prey's neck. He wanted Lee to go for Wonsuk's jugular, however Wonsuk suddenly grabbed hold of Lee's shirt, and he lifted him in the air, he called Lee a bastard, and said he doesn't know what trick Lee is using but this is where he dies. He swung his fist downwards, before his head was smashed into the ground, Lee used the flying armbar technique, and wrapped his body around Wonsuk's arm, and neck like a snake, Wonsuk stopped his punch, because if he would've hit the ground then his arm would've been broken. 
Myung-ho was impressed and he concluded that he underestimated Wonsuk. Myung-ho realized that there is no way a normal hunter can win against a barbarian who's using body strengthening, and he began to wonder if he overestimated Lee. Wonsuk laughed saying Lee is struggling for his life like the cockroach he is. He threw a punch aimed at Lee's face, he asked him if he thinks he can crush his arm like that. Lee used his strengthening skill on his hands, and he squeezed one of Wonsuk's fingers causing him to let go of his shirt. Then he moved behind Wonsuk and he put him in a rear naked choke. Myung-ho praised Lee for this move because even if Wonsuk uses the body strengthening skill, he is still susceptible to carotid artery. Wonsuk laughed saying all he needs to do to get himself out of the rear naked choke is use his strength to take Lee off of him. Wonsuk grabbed Lee's arms, and Lee began to smile menacingly. He activated his steel body strengthening around his arms. Wonsuk tried with all of his might, but to his surprise he couldn't take Lee off of him. Lee suddenly received a notification warning him that he is using the steel body strengthening skill in a wider range than his current threshold. Lee ignored the system's warning and he wrapped his arms around Wonsuk's neck even tighter. He received another notification warning him that excessive use beyond the threshold can crush his own body. One of the soldiers in the crowd turned to Sanguk asking if he wasn't going to stop the fight. He said with Wonsuk's personality, he would never tap out. Sanguk didn't respond. He was in complete disbelief from what he was seeing. While choking Wonsuk out, Lee stared at Sanguk. He wanted this to act as a warning to Sanguk to never mess with him again. As Wonsuk was about to lose consciousness he questioned if he was going to lose to a loser like Lee in this way. The thought of him, the future ace, being humiliated in front of everyone gave him the strength to hold on. He activated his body strengthening for the second time, and his body grew to a monstrous size. His clothes ripped and the roof had cracks in it because he was too tall for the building. However much to his surprise Lee was still holding onto his neck. Myung-ho was surprised that Wonsuk could use his body strengthening twice, however if he doesn't find a way to get out of the chokehold, this fight will still be over. He looked on with anticipation wondering which of the monstrous bastards would win. Wonsuk's size continued to grow, to the point where it was crushing Lee's back against the ceiling. Even though he was in extreme pain Lee continued to hold on. And a short while later Wonsuk fell unconscious, and he face planted into the ground, shocking the other soldiers. Myung-ho was excited because he finally found a real beast. Lee walked out of the octagon, and Wonsuk's friends entered asking if he was okay. They didn't receive a response so one of them quickly checked his breathing. Afterwards he informed the others that Wonsuk was still breathing, he just fainted. According to the military medic standard when someone faints they are supposed to flip them over. But Wonsuk's friends were wondering how they are going to flip the behemoth. Junmo ran over to Lee with a towel in hand saying he knew he would win. Lee stuck his palm out stopping Junmo's approach. Junmo asked Lee if he was hurt anyway, but Lee wasn't paying attention. He was looking at Sanguk, who was doing his best to avoid eye contact with Lee. Lee continued to glare at him angrily. He was interrupted by Myung-ho who asked him for his name. Lee was confused and he questioned why Myung-ho was in the training room. He saluted Myung-ho and told him his name and the company he's from. Myung-ho introduced himself as well, and he praised Lee for his excellent win. He took out a card asking Lee if he was interested in joining Special Warfare Raid. The other soldiers present were jealous. Lee just got recruited to the Black Tiger unit, the best troop in the Amped. Lee apologized, and he informed Myung-ho that he is just an F-rank hunter. He hoped Myung-ho will retract his offer. However, Myung-ho told Lee that ranks are just standards set by normal people, and the military needs more warriors like Lee. Lee tried to remain calm, but on the inside he was screaming in agony. His military superiors were just claiming their stake on him like he was some property. Lee was taking a long time to respond so Myung-ho asked if he was just going to make him keep holding his hand out like this. Lee sadly stared at the card. If he joins the Black Tiger unit then he will definitely get caught up in confrontations with villain groups later. He took the card from Myung-ho and he thanked him for the opportunity, saying he will give it a thought, however his true intention was to keep his distance from the Black Tiger unit. Sanguk glared at Lee angrily because he was winning, and he wasn't. Later that evening Myung-ho visited kang Seok in his office. kang Seok sat him down and he poured him a cup of tea. Afterwards kang Seok sat opposite of Myung-ho and he asked him if the Black Tiger unit is doing good these days. Myung-ho was slow to reply. He told kang Seok that the Black Tiger unit is always short-staffed these days. kang Seok smiled and said, these days the guilds try to recruit hunters even if they are C rank, so this is to be expected. Kang Seok continued on saying that after his team do the best they can to train the military's talent, they are taken away in the name of an outside appointment or whatever. He told Myung Ho that his unit is having a hard time like everyone else. Kang Seok laughed saying Myung Ho must be here because of Sergeant Choi Yeonjun. Myung Ho told Kang Seok that he is correct. 
and said he heard Sergeant Choi Yeonjun is on leave. Kang Seok acted like he had nothing to do with Sergeant Choi Yeonjun being on leave. Myung-ho looked down at his reflection from the tea and said, thanks to Sergeant Choi Yeonjun being on leave, he was able to find quite an interesting soldier. Kang Seok was taken aback. He lowered the cup of tea from his mouth and lifted his head to look at Myung-ho who was smiling ear to ear. This concerned him and he began to wonder who this interesting soldier is. Later that night Lee went on a jog, and Junmo followed after him. Kang Seok watched the two soldiers from one of the windows in his office, he called someone on his phone, and he asked them to find out what Lee used to do before he joined the army. Outside, Junmo caught up to Lee, and he clung on to him, he asked Lee to tell him how he managed to get so strong. Lee asked Junmo to stop clinging on to him, his exhaustion made it difficult for him to hold himself up. Junmo let go, and Lee started jogging again, Junmo continued to follow behind, saying he wanted to be like him. Lee asked why he would want to be like someone who is struggling to run. Back inside Kang Seok's office the person he was on the phone with informed him of ways to deal with Lee and Kang Seok chose one of the plans. He hung up and he looked outside the window seeing Lee's exhausted face. He smiled creepily saying what's about to happen isn't his fault, it's all Lee's fault for making others so greedy. In the busy streets of the city we see a woman and her child picking up some food from a restaurant server while she was distracted a shadowy figure passed by and the child noticed. He chased after this creature thinking it was a monkey, the creature turned into an alleyway, and it waited for the child to catch up. The child caught up and after getting a good look of the monster he realized that it wasn't a monkey and he started crying. The monster faced the child and it started laughing. Behind the monster, pairs of yellow eyes began to glow in the darkness of the alleyway. And even further behind was the gate, the monsters proceed to kill the child. Later into the night Seo Yoon Ha brought Lee to the battalion armory. Lee looked around and he was amazed by all the different and high-ranking weapons in the battalion armory. Seo Yoon Ha told Lee that the reason he was brought into the battalion armory is because Kang Seok acknowledged his accomplishments, and he wanted to give Lee a weapon as well as some days off. She also informed him that the platoon leader has yet to acknowledge his accomplishments. Lee continued to look around the armory. In his previous life the platoon leader was stuck up as well, and he concluded that it wasn't something that came with age. He told Seo Yuna that whether the platoon leader believes in him or not, doesn't matter since it's all in the past. Seo Yuna was stunned by what Lee just said, she turned around saying Lee is really smug. The sword marks on the goblins close to the gate were all the same. That means Lee stopped the first waves of goblins alone. This puzzled Seo Yuna and she asked Lee if that level of combat capability makes sense for an F rank. Lee ignored the question and he picked out a weapon. He swung the weapon up and down a few times to get a feel for it. Seo Yuna told him not to pick any random weapon just because he was backed into a corner, and she asked him to pick another weapon. However, Lee refused saying he likes this one. Lee checked the information of the cloud blade, and he wasn't disappointed. The blade had the effect of absorbing water and releasing wet fog. To others this blade may seem like a useless and trash item. But in the future Sergeant Choi Yeonjun becomes known as the Sword Saint with this one blade. This blade's real name is Dark Hand of the Cloud Master. In Dangan mythology along with H1 Woom, three weather gods descended upon Earth, the Wind Lord, Rain Master, and the Cloud Master. Among them, the god called the Cloud Master had the power to control clouds, and his pitch black hand was called the Hand of Darkness. The Cloud Master's Hand of Darkness, upon interpretation, means blades hidden amidst the clouds. The blades hidden amidst the clouds referred to none other than the thunder god, and upon releasing the blade's full power, the user of the blade becomes capable of using lightning strong enough to clear a mid-sized dungeon alone. Lee lifted the blade in the air and smiled. With the combination of steel and lightning, nothing would be able to beat him. He apologized to Sergeant Yeonjun saying this time he will be the one taking the cloud blade. Seo Yuna asked Lee if he is really considering that scrappy blade a reward for his accomplishments. Lee told her that the blade is perfect for him, and said he wouldn't have enough time to pick another weapon. Suddenly after Lee said that a siren started going off taking Seo Yuna by surprise, a soldier announced that a gate had opened in Idiwan. The alarm woke the other soldiers and they began to scatter around quickly preparing themselves to respond to the gate. Back inside the armory Lee wasn't surprised by the siren at all. Seo Yuna began to wonder why Lee wasn't surprised. She also took note of the fact that he looked calm, as if he was expecting the siren. A short while later the soldiers arrived at the scene and they quickly set up a base of operations, and we see hunters who were wearing knightly armor marching through the streets where the soldiers had set up camp. Two soldiers watched the hunters as they marched through. One of the soldiers was captivated, as this was his first time seeing members from the Blue Flower Guild. The other soldier told the first soldier that the Blue Flower Guild members are here because they will need backup for this gate. They continued to admire the armors the Blue Flower Guild members were wearing. All of their equipment was designer goods, and if they could just sell one of those equipment, they would have enough money to buy a building in Gangnam. 
The second soldier told the first soldier that once his service is over, he will get transferred to the Blue Flower Guild and live his entire life flexing. Their admiration session for the Blue Flower Guild was interrupted by Lee's voice. Lee had just arrived with his unit, the members of his unit quickly got in a straight line, and Lee, who was in front, started getting a head count of the soldiers in his unit. After the head counts were finished Lee told the soldiers that the gate this time is a cobbled gate, and although cobbleds are small monsters, they are still difficult to deal with since they use poison needles and gas, and sometimes the casualties are greater than when fighting against great orcs, so there will be no rolling up of sleeves in the middle of duty. After hearing this one of the soldiers in the front quickly lowered his sleeves, that same soldier told Lee that it's not likely the cobbled will reach them. And he asked if they really need to be taking this so seriously. Lee told the soldier that this isn't a drill. And he asked if the soldier would like to have cobbleds gouge his eyes out while he is still alive. The soldier lowered his head and said he wouldn't. Lee then told them to inspect their masks to make sure it will provide protection against poison gas in case of an emergency. The two soldiers from earlier approached Lee saying they are surprised the trash unit also held strategy meetings. Soldier 2 laughed saying someone could mistake the trash unit for the support squad in a raid or something. The two soldiers teasing lowered the morale of Lee's unit. Lee quickly noticed and he turned to Soldier 2, Quack Jinchial, saying many cobbles escape the red ground, an area where the evacuation order is issued when gates are opened during the raid, so he shouldn't be so carefree just because they were at the back. He told him to have his gas masks ready, Jinchial placed his hands on Soldier 1's helmet wondering why Lee was yapping so much. He smiled, and he told Lee that he could take care of himself, and said he is not some lowly shit that sidekicks like Lee should be giving advice to. Lee didn't argue with him, he just reminded Jinchial to keep in mind that he was warned. Jinchial and the other soldier walked off, Jinchial teased Lee saying I will keep that in mind Mr. Squad Commander of the Shitty Squad. The morale in Lee's squad had dropped even lower, Lee greeted his teeth and he told the soldiers to return to their senses. He says this isn't their first time hearing this, and they are in a real-life situation where death could be around the door, so they shouldn't lose their spirits. This somehow restored some of the soldiers' morale. Lee lifted a motion sensor into the air, and said since cobbles have small build they will need to attach all the motion sensors they brought with them in the sewers and narrow passageways. He gave the other soldiers 20 minutes to get the job done and they ran to the truck and they started taking out boxes of motion sensors. Junmo was about to join the other soldiers but Lee quickly stopped him. After some struggle the soldiers were able to get one of the boxes down, and as they placed it down the two discussed with each other. They were wondering why Lee seemed so serious today. Junmu questioned why Lee called him, and as Lee was about to answer, he was shot in the neck with a dart, and he fell over. Suddenly gas spewed from the sewers, and it quickly covered the entire area. Some soldiers who didn't have their masks equipped quickly died. Luckily some were quick enough to equip their masks, however this didn't matter much because the cobbled started attacking. Lee laid on the ground struggling to move his body because the dart had been poisoned. As he laid there struggling, what seemed like the boss monster approached. The monster took out a knife and it smiled at Lee. As it was about to stab Lee's eyes out Junmo came out of nowhere and he trucked the monster. Junmo took out a mask and he handed it to Lee. Lee quickly told Junmo to run. Confused Junmo asked Lee if something was wrong, and he said Lee should hurry and put on his mask. In an instant Junmo's head was sliced off. In his previous life this was how Junmo lost his life, and in the present Lee looked at Junmo determined to make sure Junmo survives. Some soldiers had finished installing the sensors on their sides, and another group asked them to bring some sensors to them. Lee called Junmo's name again. Junmo answered and he said he is ready to follow any order that Lee relays to him. Lee told him that he will send a signal later and when he sent the signal he wanted Junmo to take the squad and leave the operation zone. Junmo was shocked, and he told Lee that if he did that it would be armed desertion. Lee told Junmo that it wasn't, instead it's something he likes to call war tactics. Inside the control room, the control team received a report from three teams. Team Delta reported that Zone 1 and 3 had no survivors. Team Epsilon reported that Zones 4, 5 and 6 also had no survivors. Team Gamma reported that there are no survivors within the first red ground. And at an abandoned building Team Bader reported that they discovered a cobbled's nest in Zone 2. The estimated cobbled count was over 200, and they planned on entering the abandoned building using the wide-range magic formation. The captain of Squad Beta gave the signal to his squad, and they swiftly entered the building, then rushed to the center and quickly got into formation. The cobbleds in the building surrounded them and quickly rushed in for an attack. The captain waited until the last second to tell the soldiers to fire. When he gave the order, the mages in his unit activated the flamethrower skill burning the cobbleds, and the nun mages opened fire. Back at the soldiers' camp, Lee's unit had finished attaching all the sensors in Zone 2 and Zone 5. As Lee was helping his team attach the sensors, Minhee approached, questioning what he was doing. 
Lee stood up and he saluted Minhee. He told him that he was helping his team attach the motion sensors according to the manual and marking the relevant location with aluminum tape. Then he called Lee a piece of shit. He pointed at the Blue Flower Guild members saying they were there to assist. So Lee should stop making a fool of himself over a cobbled gate. He told Lee that the first platoon will start its operation in 20 minutes, so Lee's unit should just get the detox potions. Lee reminded Minhee that the mission to stop the escaping monsters from reaching the civilian area was relayed to them by the vice platoon commander. Because of Lee's shouting a crowd was beginning to gather, which irritated Minhee. Minhee told Lee that he was forgetting his place just because the battalion commander took an interest in him. He tapped Lee's helmet asking him if he had more than one real battle experience, and Lee replied no. Min he continued on saying how dare Lee try to teach him when he only has one real battle experience. A pink-haired girl approached them, Sergeant Choi Sianha, a C-rank mage who specializes in healing, asked Min he if something was wrong. Lee turned and smiled. This is the reason he provoked Min he into coming here. Siana was his only weakness. Min he started laughing, and he told Siana that it seemed like the support squad was having a hard time assessing the site, so he was just explaining to them what a real battle's like. With a big smile on his face, Min he asked Siana why she was here, and Siana said she was here because the battalion commander called for Lee. Surprised, Lee pointed at himself, wondering if she meant him. Then he walked away and on a rooftop of one of the buildings, Seo Yuna and some snipers were on standby. Seo Yuna used her binoculars to observe Lee from the rooftops, and the snipers were using their guns to spy on Lee. Siana told Lee that he shouldn't let what Minhee is saying get to him. However, Minhee wasn't important to Lee right now. He told Siana that he still has work to do, so leaving now would be hard. Siana told him not to worry about it. She winked at him saying she will finish setting up the sensors so Lee should go see the battalion commander now. Lee was reluctant to go because there wasn't much time left, and he wondered why the battalion commander was calling him all of the sudden. One of the snipers on the rooftops turned to Seo Yuna asking if it was okay for their attack squad to be here in a cobbled raid when they are under the battalion commander's direct command. Seo Yuna told them not to worry about it and said, This was the battalion commander's orders. She took off her binoculars and added that soldiers are just meant to follow the orders they are given. Inside the battalion commander's temporary command post Lee reported in, however much to his surprise Lieutenant Myungho was also present. This confused him and he wondered what these two were doing together. Kang Seok spoke to Lee saying he was going to give him a test. He asked Lee to take the place of Choi Yeonjun, who is currently on leave, and serve as the temporary squad leader of the first platoon for the second strike mission on the gate. Lee kept his composure but on the inside he was having a breakdown. The higher-ups had never paid attention to him in his previous life, not even once, so he was wondering why they are doing it now. He quickly realized that time was quickly running out, so he got his act together. And he told Kang Siok that he has only carried out missions with the support squad, and since this isn't a drill, he didn't understand why Kang Siok wanted to put the lives of the first platoon on the line during an actual battle. Kang Siok crossed his fingers, and he told Lee that this was his order. Lee angrily bit his bottom lip. It seemed like there was no way out of this. Then Delta Squad reported into Kang Siok that the boss monster left the cobbled nest, and they advised the personnel on the second and third red ground to stay alert. Lee turned his attention to the report. He knows that this is a sign that the kobolds will pounce on the support squad soon, and if he doesn't get there in time, the whole rear squad will be annihilated. Team Delta advised again that the second and third personnel on the red ground should stay alert. This made Lee greet his teeth, and decided to get out of Kang Siok's temporary command post as soon as possible no matter the cost. He told Kang Siok that he had something to say, and Kang Siok gave him permission to say it. Some time later outside Kang Siok's temporary command post, Seo Yuna saw Lee running out of the temporary command post, and it seemed like he was heading back to his unit. Lee was running at full speed. He called out to his team trying to warn them about the gas at the site the sensors that Lee's unit had set up started going off. But before they could respond gas started spewing from the sewers. When Lee arrived the gas had completely covered the entire site. Lee was in shock because the incident was happening quicker than he remembers. He quickly covered his nose and mouth. Before Lee bolted out of the battalion commander's temporary command post, he spoke saying he had something to say to the battalion commander. Kang Siok allowed him to speak, and Lee expressed that he heard a rumor that on the battalion commander's first mission he lost all his platoon members. This shocked Kang Siok and Lieutenant Myung Ho, however they remained silent and they allowed Lee to continue. Lee explained that it was his belief that Kang Siok is ordering him to join the combat squad for the sake of a test, even though he is the lowly corporal of the so-called shitty support squad. Lee questioned if this means that Kang Siok, the command battalion that he so respects, also considers the regular soldiers to be expendable. 
Kang Seok's demeanor changed suddenly. He crossed his arms, and with a serious expression on his face, he told Lee that there is a misunderstanding here. But before he could continue explaining, Lee interrupted him, and he expressed that if it's to follow Kang Seok's orders, he would gladly give his life. Lee held a serious expression on his face, but on the inside he was frustrated. He didn't know what to do since he couldn't tell Kang Seok that he knew the future. Lee explained to Kang Seok that if he, with his lack of battlefield experience, were to command someone else's squad, there is a very real possibility of casualties. He expressed that he was grateful for the battalion commander's expectations of him, but if the price of that validation is the lives of his comrades in arms, then he will disobey the order. Kang Seok lowered his head, and his expression turned from serious to cold, and Lieutenant Myung Ho shouted at Lee. He explained that defiance during wartime is a capital offense, and he questioned if Lee knows what that implies. Lee lowered his head, he thought to himself, questioning if his higher-ups think he doesn't know that, however if he doesn't go now, everyone in the rear guard will die. Much to Lieutenant Mungo's surprise, Kang Siok allowed Lee to go ahead with the original support mission today, but he expressed that like a true soldier Lee will have to deal with the consequences of disobeying orders later. Back to the present, Lee quickly took out a gas mask, and he quickly wore it. Then he took out the cloud blade from his inventory bag on his right leg. The inventory bag allowed him to store military supplies, and the number of items he could store varied for higher-ups and soldiers. Lee took out a canteen containing water, and he poured the water on the cloud blade. The cloud blade started absorbing the water Lee poured on it, and its absorption rate had already risen to 25%. Lee continued to pour water on the blade, but the entire time he had his attention turned in the direction of his platoon, he questioned if he was too late, and he prayed that Junmo would take everyone and run like he told them. At the battlefield, one of the members of Lee's platoon was brought down by a kobold. The kobold struck its pickaxe in the soldier's side. The soldier screamed out in pain. He lifted his hand in the air, and he called out to Junmo for help. Junmo heard the cries of the soldier and he took aim in the soldier's direction. He opened fire while screaming for the fucking rat-like monster to get away from his comrade. The kobold heard the gun shots. He fell back while dodging all of the bullets. After the kobold fell back, Junmo called out for the members of the support squad and he ordered them to get inside the box. The box refers to a place with a basic barrier spell around it for transporting supplies and setting up camp in case of an emergency. Junmo also ordered them to bring the injured soldier, On Minty, with them. One of the members of the support squad crawled over to On, and after he made contact, he informed Junmo that he had secured Private On Minty. Junmo and the other soldiers in the box covered this soldier as he brought Private On Minty inside the box. The entire time this was happening Sergeant Choi Sionha, the healer as well as the vice platoon leader was having a mental breakdown. Junmo called out to her, he shouted for her to come back to her senses, however Sergeant Choi Sionha was now having a panic attack. Sergeant Choi Siano was barely 20 years old, so it made sense to Junmo that she was acting like this, especially since it's her first real mission after appointment. But she couldn't do anything for the support squad in this situation. A soldier then informed Junmo that they were running out of ammo, and another soldier reported that he was on his last magazine. Junmo didn't know what to do, he questioned if they were all going to die here, and as this thought crossed his mind, he asked himself, what would Corporal Lee do in this situation? The soldier that was attending to Private On Minty informed Sergeant Choi Siana that Private On Minty needed medical attention. Hearing this Lee reached into his inventory bag and he pulled out a metal object. At the same time a soldier announced that they were now out of ammo. Junmo stared at the metallic object he just pulled out from his inventory bag. Afterwards he turned to the support squad and he got their attention. Then he explained that kobolds are obsessed with shiny things, so he would attack them to lure them away, while all platoon members get out of here with the vice platoon leader and the injured. The other soldiers stared at Junmo with a perplexed look on their face, and they questioned what he was saying. Junmo lifted the metallic object in the air, and electricity began flowing through the object. He told the other soldiers that this was in order, and he explained that Lee told them that the Blue Flower Guild is just outside the Red Ground. So when he gave the signal he wanted the soldiers to clench their teeth and run for their lives in the direction of the Blue Flower Guild. Before giving the signal Junmo turned his attention to the kobolds. Then he looked up at the metal object. He thought to himself that even though his pathetic electric powers can't even kill a single monster, in the end he gets to use it to save people's lives. He gave the signal, and he ran into the horde of kobolds with the metallic object raised high while making as much noise as possible. All the kobolds in the surrounding area fixed their gaze on the metallic object Junmo was carrying, and they began to chase after him. As he ran, Junmo announced to the others that this is their chance, 
so they should all run. Junno continued to lead the horde of kobolds away from the box, and as he ran he thought out loud that if Lee was here, he was sure he would have used his pathetic power like this. He was certain that if Lee was here, he would have definitely used him as bait. As he ran the kobolds that were close on his behind were suddenly cut down, and Junmo bumped into a soldier, and he fell to the ground. The soldier spoke, calling Junmo a rascal for what he was saying. The soldier, Lee, lifted the cloud blade in the air, and he activated the wet fog effect of the cloud blade. The wet fog was neutralizing the toxic gas as it spread, and Lee called Junmo's name. Junmo replied saying it's not what Lee thinks, he explained that he was just imitating Lee, and he got carried away. Lee thanked Junmo for being alive, and with a smile he praised Junmo for doing a good job. This brought Junmo to tears, the monsters however weren't so touched, and they became riled up. Lee continued on saying that he was sincerely proud of Junmo, he turned his attention to the kobolds, and he explained that thanks to Junmo's noble courage, he gets to enjoy a feast. With an enthusiastic smile, Lee expressed that since Junmo set up such a great meal for him, he shall devour it with all he has. Using his combat knife, Lee cut down another portion of the kobolds who were chasing after Junmo. The dead kobolds dropped mana steel and Lee stared at the mana steel, and he expressed that they looked delicious. Confused, Junmo asked him if he was talking about the kobolds. Lee glared at Junmo with a slightly annoyed look. He couldn't eat the mana steel because of Junmo. The kobolds were now hesitant to attack, and Lee stared at them questioning where their boss was. Suddenly the magic circle on the kobolds' foreheads began to glow, and they all started running away from Lee. Lee quickly realized what was going on. He called out to Junmo and expressed that their squad members were in danger. He asked Junmo to follow after him as he chased after the kobolds. On a roof, the attack squad who were observing Lee reported to Siyuna that they were having difficulties getting a clear view because of the gas, and at this rate any assistance is impossible. Siyuna ordered them to maintain their current position and shoot all kobolds that escape the gas zone along with the Blue Flower Guild so they can't reach the civilians. The snipers replied saying they understood their mission, however, However, they questioned if Seo Yuna was going somewhere. Seo Yuna had put on her gas mask, the way Lee acted, made it seem as if he knew this was happening. She told the soldiers that there is something she wanted to confirm. She dropped down from the roof and into the fog. Back at the box Sergeant Choi Siana was still panicking. She called out over and over again, with tears running down her face, for someone to come and save her. The soldier that had been looking after Private An Minty informed her that An Minty has lost consciousness and is on the brink of death. The soldier told her that An Minty needs to be healed now if he is to survive, and he asked her to get her act together. The soldiers that were on the lookout reported that the box was about to be torn apart. The boss monster was using a spell to pull apart the structure of the box. Two soldiers tried pulling on the part of the structure the boss monster was targeting. However, the boss monster spell was too strong and it was able to break through the box barrier. Afterwards, the kobolds began closing in on the box. The soldiers began to panic. They questioned if there's anything that could be done, and if they would all die here. Seeing this, the boss monster couldn't help but smile. However, Lee's voice could suddenly be heard calling out, and his and Junmo's shadowy figures began to appear behind the kobolds that were closing in on the box. Lee shouted for the fucking rats to stop messing with his squad. He motioned his hand down, and his combat knife almost struck the boss monster down. But the boss monster was able to dodge at the last second. Before Lee's combat knife hit the ground, he manipulated it to chase after the boss monster like a heat-seeking missile. The boss monster did its best to evade Lee's attack, and even though Lee wasn't able to land a hit on the boss, he was able to damage the gird the boss monster was carrying that was emitting the poisonous gas. This angered the boss monster, and suddenly the magic circles on the kobold's forehead began to glow again. Suddenly they moved in different directions, afterwards they shot poisonous needles at Lee and Junmo. Lee stopped, he moved in front of the poisonous needles, and he blocked them all with the cloud blade, however when he turned his head, he noticed that the needles were coming from that direction as well. He pushed Junmo down, and he used his metal control ability to stop all the poisonous needles that were heading towards them, but in the process he lost control of his combat knife. The boss monster stared at the combat knife as it hit the ground, and it started smiling menacingly. Lee was starting to get irritated. He first thought the dark kobold mage was commanding the kobolds, but it was literally controlling them. Lee took out his gun, and he opened fire, however the kobolds were able to dodge the bullets. He now realized that scaring the kobolds won't buy him any time, and it's too dangerous to be fighting with Junmo by his side. Lee told Junmo that they would be retreating to the box. Junmo turned to Lee questioning if he should go when Lee gave the signal. Lee took off running, he said fuck the signal, and he told Junmo to just run. As the two ran, the kobolds shot poisonous needles at their backs. Lee turned his head, and he noticed the poisonous needles that were heading towards them. He stopped and he changed the direction of the poisonous needles using his metal control ability, and after Junmo was safely behind the box, 
he quickly made his way behind the box as well. When he was inside the box, he looked back, and he saw the poisonous needles being deflected by the basic barrier. This greatly angered the boss monster. Lee turned to his squad and with a pleasant smile, he expressed that even though he was a bit late, at least he made it. Lee turned to see that the morale of his squad was down, and that they had suffered some injuries. Junmo, who had made his way over to check on Private On Minty, called out to Lee, and he informed him that On Minty had lost consciousness. Lee was confused, and he questioned why Junmo was telling him this when the person in charge of healing the injured is right there. Lee turned his attention to Sergeant Choi Siana, and he saw her shaking. He shouted questioning what she was doing when Private On Minty was dying. As he stared at her, he realized that she was in the middle of having a panic attack, and with their healer like this, there is no doubt that they will be annihilated. Lee took a deep breath and he called Sergeant Choi Sianha. When she didn't respond he slapped her. Confused Sergeant Choi Sianha turned to face Lee. Lee stared at her and he asked her if she wanted everyone to die. He ordered her to come back to her senses. Lee also reminded Sianha that they were in the middle of a battlefield. He asked her if she planned on living her whole life regretting this moment. As he spoke Lee started getting irritated, and finally he asked Siana if she knows how horrifying living a life full of regret is. This question finally snapped Siana out of her panic, and she approached Private On Minty and she started healing him. A short while later, Lee asked her about Private On Minty's condition, and she told him that On Minty lost a lot of blood because she was late, however that doesn't mean she was going to give up. Lee, with a pleasant smile on his face, thanked her for her effort. Then he turned to the other soldiers and he announced that he would be borrowing their combat knives. He used his steel manipulation ability to take the soldiers' combat knives out of their pockets. This made Junno question in a hesitant tone if Lee planned on leaving the box to take on the boss, and Lee replied with an irritable look on his face saying he has to give the monsters back the pain they caused. The scene then shifts and we see a car racing down a highway. A feminine voice could be heard in the car discussing an amusing event that is happening. Afterwards the lady hung up the call, and she expressed that she will have to pay a visit for consolation, and she asked her driver to head for Ediwin. At the battle scene, Lee left the box and we see him heading through the poisonous cloud with the cloud blade lifted in the air, and the shadows of kobolds could be seen observing him from a distance. Lee finally came to a stop after coming across a marked spot on the ground. The boss monster, who was further away observing Lee, ordered the kobolds to attack. The kobolds were influenced by the boss monster, and they started approaching Lee. However, in the midst of this Lee could be seen smiling. He glanced around, and he made note of the fact that his prey was walking into the perfect hunting spot all on their own. The spot that was marked on the ground marked the center of their operation zone, and he set this up purposefully while the other soldiers were setting up the sensors. The only problem is there is a margin error in a section of Area A, which is commanded by Vice Platoon Leader Sianha. Lee knows that if he is able to get his hands on the boss monster, who is pulling the strings from behind, then it will be over for the remaining kobolds. He closed his eyes, and he used the metal detection skill. The skill created an image in his head that showed him the location of all the metals in his surroundings. And with this skill he was able to determine the location of all the kobolds, who were approaching him, by focusing on metals he didn't recognize, like the kobolds pickaxe. He opened his eyes, and he used the metal control skill to spread the combat knives out, and he wiped out the wave of kobolds that were approaching him. Seeing this the boss monster started to panic, and in its panic one of the combat knives that Lee was manipulating approached from behind. The boss monster was able to notice in time, and it used its magic to stop the combat knife. Lee noticed that something had stopped one of the combat knives, and he determined that it must be the boss monster. So he turned his attention to that location, and he manipulated five combat knives to head for the boss. The boss monster let out a battle cry that sent a shiver down Lee's spine, and it activated its magic to stop the combat knives in their tracks. Then it stared at Lee with a furious gaze. Lee motioned his hand back demanding the boss monster give him back the combat knives. In this process he received a message from the system that informed him that the combat knives are bound by a four higher than the controllable weight. This shocked Lee, and he stared at the message questioning if that means his metal control skill won't work. The boss monster then controlled the kobolds to get in position, and they shot poisonous needles at Lee's blind spot. Lee noticed the poisonous needles but it was too late. He lifted his hands to cover his face as he was hit with a barrage of poisonous needles. He lost control of the combat knives he was using to attack the boss monster. Seeing that Lee's skill had worn off, the boss monster brought its hands down, and it pointed at Lee, motioning for the other kobolds to attack. The remaining kobolds rushed at Lee who had fallen to his knee. Lee gritted his teeth in a rage, and he expressed that the kobolds almost had him thinking that it was over, just like his previous life. 
He stood up, and the poisonous needles fell off him. If it hadn't been for his strengthening body transformation skill, then it truly would have been over. He manipulated the combat knives to bring them back to him, and with a furious look on his face, he called the kobolds little shits, and he shouted for them to get lost. He created a giant vortex by circulating the combat knives around himself at incredible speeds. The vortex sucked up and cut down the kobolds that were charging at him. It also cleared some of the poisonous gas in the area. Afterwards he called out the boss monster and he expressed that it's time for them to settle the score. In response to Lee the boss monster started releasing more poisonous gas from its gourd, and the poisonous gas quickly filled the area again. Luckily the cloud blade's ability was still activated so Lee was able to breathe. He expressed loudly to the boss monster who had disappeared into the poisonous gas that it would be pointless for it to continue struggling. And he asked if the boss monster knows how much effort he put into making sure that it will be the only one remaining. He activated his metal detection ability again, and he was able to determine the boss monster's location. However he knew that he would have to attack carefully, since recklessly throwing the combat knives at the boss monster will only get them caught like last time. So he continued to observe the movements of the boss monster. The boss monster had its hand on the ground and it wasn't moving from this position. This made Lee question why the boss monster's movements had stopped. He looked down at his feet, and he noticed that the boss monster's magic was moments away from grabbing hold of his leg. In a panic he tried stepping back, but the boss monster's magic was able to grab hold of his leg. This caused Lee to lose his balance and he fell on his back. The boss monster picked him off the ground using its magic, and it brought him above the poisonous gas, then it threw Lee into an area that had a higher concentration of poisonous gas. The boss monster stood from the ground, and it started laughing and relishing in what it thought was victory. Lee shouted from the poisonous gas, calling the boss monster a little rat. This shocked the boss monster, and it turned its attention to Lee, who looked battered up. Lee, who barely survived by strengthening his legs with his ability, questioned why the boss monster was laughing. And with a furious look on his face he asked how many times the boss monster planned on giving him PTSD flashbacks today. The boss monster crouched down, and it quickly moved behind Lee, and it tried to stab Lee with its dagger, however Lee noticed, and he dodged the attack by moving out of the way. Lee was taken aback that the boss monster dared to aim for his back, and to counter he swung the cloud blade downwards, while questioning if the boss monster knows how much he despises being stabbed in the back. The boss monster was able to block Lee's attack, so he activated his body strengthening skill on his leg, and he kicked the boss monster in the face. While expressing that the boss monster needs a beating, the kick shattered the boss monster's mask, and it sent it tumbling backwards. Lee approached the boss monster asking if he knew how many times he imagined this moment. How many times he imagined when he would finally take revenge against this backstabber. He expressed that he has been looking forward to this day since the day he regressed. The boss monster was the first so far, so he told it to think of this as an honor. The battered boss monster glared at Lee with a furious look on its face, and Lee stared back at it with a grin on his face. With the boss monster's mask crushed to pieces, it can no longer use its shitty magic, so Lee decided that it's time to cure his PTSD. Using the metal control skill Lee manipulated the combat knives again, and he cut the boss monster. This attack also broke the boss monster's gourd. And while it wallowed in pain, Lee approached, expressing that the boss monster is quite sissy, and he reminded it that it wasn't dead yet. He picked up the boss monster by the mouth, and he lifted it in the air, and in a cold tone he asked if it knew how many years he spent as a cripple because of it. He told the boss monster that he was just cut by the combat knives of his squad members, whom it annihilated in his previous life. He recalled his memories of Junmo's death, and he expressed to the boss monster that this next attack was for Park Junmo, who died trying to save him in his previous life. He stabbed the boss monster with the cloud blade, and he received a message from the system. The system informed him that the cloud blade was absorbing the blood of an elite monster, and it was 1% done with being filled with an unknown energy. As the cloud blade absorbed its blood, the boss monster slowly started losing strength. Lee used metal control, and he brought the boss monster's dagger and pointed it at its forehead. He told the boss monster that it can't die yet, since there's one more step to go. He expressed that this final attack was payback for the scar it left on his face in his previous life. Then using the dagger he split the boss monster's face in two. Afterwards he dropped the boss monster's body to the ground, with the cloud blade still stuck in its body. He received a message from the system, informing him that the cloud blade was 11% finished with being filled with an unknown energy. He was also informed that the cloud blade's latent powers will be unlocked when it's completely filled with the unknown energy. Lee stared at the boss monster's corpse, and he let out a sigh of relief. With this he reversed the first event of his past that's been haunting him. Suddenly a medallion dropped from the boss monster's corpse. This shocked Lee, and as he picked it up, he received a message from the system that showed him the medallion's information. 
This item is a Hellfire medallion that contains the power of the devilish race demons. It's the highest ranked item in the metal series, and its name is Devil's Medallion Inferno. Lee stared at the medallion with a puzzled look on his face, and he questioned why this item was appearing here. The Devil's Medallion Inferno belongs to a being Lee referred to as him. He narrates that this being's undead army was hell for the humans that survived. He was humanity's worst villain, a necromancer. There is virtually no intel about this person. The only thing Lee knows is that they both have the specific growth trait. After regression, Lee hid the fact that he could advance from F rank because of this person. In his previous life, Lee was barely able to end the battle at this person's blue lava golem workshop, and afterwards he got a mere replica of Inferno. This made him question why the original of Inferno was here right now. He gritted his teeth, questioning if there was something else he doesn't know about. He took a look around, and he noticed that the poisonous cloud was clearing up, so he decided to eat Inferno first. However, as he was putting it in his mouth, Seo Yuna called out to him. She took out her sword, and she pointed it at him, demanding that Lee tell her who he is. She also asked him to come clean about what he was hiding. Lee used his metal control ability to put the Inferno medallion in his back pocket. Then he lifted his hands, and with a perplexed look on his face, he asked Seo Yuna what she meant. At this point Lee knows that he is screwed, however he doesn't know how much of the fight Seo Yuna saw. Suddenly the woman from the car earlier approached while applauding. She expressed that even though she only saw Lee's battle from afar, it was still impressive. The woman took off her gas mask, and she made note of the fact that Seo Yuna, who she recognized as the third daughter of the captain of the paladins, was present. And she expressed with shock that Seo Yuna was all grown up now. Lee quickly recognized this woman, and he couldn't help but glare at her with a furious gaze. Seo Yuna expressed that she is the captain of the 1st Battalion Attack Squad of the 3rd Amp Brigade, and she reminded this woman that she is inside a military operations area, a place where civilians aren't allowed. However, the woman ignored her, and she approached Lee. She took out her guild card, and as she was reaching forth her hand to give Lee the card, she introduced herself as Catherine Yu, head of the Soul Attack Unit of the Blue Flower Guild. Catherine is the second daughter of the leader of Korea's most powerful civilian guild, the Blue Flower Guild, and she is in a rank hunter. Catherine shoved the Blue Flower Guild's card in Lee's face, expecting him to fondle over it. However, to her surprise, Lee seemed uninterested. This led her to ask if Lee doesn't know who she is. Lee, who could barely contain his anger, bit his bottom lip to mask it. Of course he knew who Catherine was, of all the villains annihilating mankind. She is one who he couldn't forget about even if he tried. In a flashback we see Seo Yuna who positioned herself in the front lines to block an attack aimed at Lee. She called out to him, expressing that he should get his act together since he has to survive through this at all costs, and in response Lee shouted for her to get out of the way. However she refused, she faced Lee, and with a pleasant smile, she told him that she wouldn't move because she was his shield. Soon after Seo Yuna was devoured by countless bugs, and that memory was ingrained into Lee, and he would always remember Catherine as Seo Yuna's murderer. In the present Catherine, flaunted the Blue Flower Guild's card in her hand, while saying Lee has a huge opportunity in front of him right now. Lee remained silent, his body began to tremble as he struggled to contain his anger. Seo Yuna reminded Catherine that this was a military operation area again, and she asked her to leave. Catherine sighed, then she turned her head towards Seo Yuna, questioning if soldiers aren't supposed to be calling others by their ranks. She expressed that Seo Yuna should be calling her department head of the soul attack squads of the Blue Flower Guild. Lee's anger was suddenly replaced with a feeling of discomfort and confusion as sparks flew between the two ladies in front of him. A military vehicle approached, and out came Kang Siok. After seeing Kang Siok, Seo Yuna saluted him, and she started giving a report about the situation, but he just asked her to wait. He turned to the right, noticing the corpses of kobolds that laid on the floor, then he turned to the left, and he noticed the boss monster's corpse which still had Lee's cloud blade struck through its chest. As Kang Siok looked around, Lee started sweating nervously as he realized that there is no way out of this one. Kang Siok turned his gaze to Lee, and instantly Lee's conscience tried to run away, however Lee held it back. His conscience fought back, saying Lee should handle this mess on his own. Firstly Kang Siok addressed Catherine, the two exchanged greetings, and Kang Siok expressed that the military is extremely grateful for the reinforcements sent by the Blue Flower Guild, but he reminded her that this is a military operations area, an unauthorized entry into the operations area without prior agreement is not acceptable, even for a guild like the Blue Flowers Guild and he asked her to leave. Catherine expressed in a disappointed tone that as typical, soldiers are very inflexible, and they were getting in the way when she was just about to get into the important stuff. She kissed the Blue Flower Guild's card leaving a lipstick mark, then she placed it in Lee's armor, and with a smile she asked Lee to call her. As Catherine was walking away, Kang Siok called out to Lee, and like a robot following commands Lee quickly stood with his hands to his side. 
Kang Siok expressed in a formal tone that from now on Lee is the squad commander for the Kobold operation, and that he should prioritize the rescue of the survivors too. He was also entrusting Lee with the delegation of the assignment of the squad members. This all shocked Seo Yuna. It also shocked Lee, and he stared at Kang Siok wondering what he could be thinking. Kang Siok continued on saying that as for the debriefing, after this whole situation is wrapped up, Lee should report to him, and someone he referred to as that person. Lee accepted his orders, and as Kang Siok and Seo Yuna were walking away, Seo Yuna glared back at Lee. This sent a shiver down his spine, but he guessed that he should be happy since he was past the crisis. One week later inside the 3rd Amp Brigade, 1st Battalion, Lee received a message from the system. The message informed him that the absorption of Devil's Medallion Inferno was complete, and his controllable metal weight increased by 500 grams, bringing his total of current controllable metal weight to 3,458 grams. Inside the bathroom, weird noises could be heard from one of the stalls. Lee received another message from the system, informing him that a breath room was forming in his stomach, which was 1% done. The system warned him that during this process he might feel excruciating pain. We then see Lee inside one of the stalls holding his stomach and the toilet seat, as flames emit from his mouth. Lee already went through this in his previous life, but because his body is still weak, it was so much more painful than what he remembered. Junmo entered the bathroom, and weird sounds coming from Lee's stall quickly filled the bathroom. Junmo recognized the voice to be Lee's voice, and he leaned on the door of the stall questioning why Lee was looking at something nice all by himself. Lee told Junmo that it's not what he thinks, the pain had gotten worse, and Lee's eyes began to glow, his ascension had begun. Junmo, who didn't believe him, asked him to show him the goods later, but suddenly he was taken aback by the bright light coming from Lee's stall, and Lee shouted one more time, telling Junmo that it's not what he thinks. The cobbled gate that everyone underestimated caused a large number of casualties. Fortunately Sergeant Choi Sianha pulled Private An Minty out of critical condition, and he was safely transported to the military hospital. After that incident Lee gave up on the thought of protecting everyone alone and he started training the support squad members for them to at least be able to defend themselves. However, the cobbled gate left him with two problems, the first one being that Sergeant Choi Siana started bothering him a lot after that day. The military was proving to have too many variables for things to go according to his plans, and the second problem is Kang Siok wanted him to quit working as an NCO and join him as a commissioned officer. At this point Lee wasn't even surprised anymore. Battalion Commander Kang Siok then went on to portray that the Idiwin operation convinced him about Lee. It convinced him that Lee would be perfect for his dream to create an ideal military culture where ranks didn't matter as per his beliefs. Lee, however, couldn't understand why Kang Siok wanted to involve him in his dream. He turned his head, and he expressed in a reluctant tone that he will think about it during his vacation. Three weeks later the day of Lee's vacation finally came, and Lee spent most of the first day in a bathroom, getting enlightened. However, during this little detour, he fulfilled a special condition, and he was informed by the system that he has been granted a new skill. The system brought up the information of the skill. The fire skill breath room had two effects. The first was in vivo furnace, which speeds up metal absorption, between 50 to 250 percent. However, the more efficient the furnace, the higher the pain inflicted on Lee's body, the second effect is fire breath. With this Lee can store some of his metal in a breath chamber and fire it off as a breath, this effect consumes 3 grams of metal per breath. Lee sat in the bathroom stall, in a defeated position, and as steam evaporated from his body, he expressed that he can finally stop the rumors of him doing weird things in the bathroom. He made his way to the sink and as he washed his hands, he made note of the fact that as he is right now, he might not be able to handle the next gate. From his memory he knows that Kang Siok faced a lot of backlash from the media for not being able to save the citizens inside Seoul Station, and that a lot of citizens inside Seoul Station died. In this gate he could die for real, so it's a must that he prepares himself during this vacation. He quickly exited the building where he used the bathroom, since it's now time for him to actually change the future. We then see Choi Siana putting a cigarette in her mouth. She expressed that it's been a long time since her last vacation, and she noted that military life is very shit. She took out a lighter, but try as she might, her lighter failed to work. Lee ran into her, and she stared at him, questioning if he had a lighter. Lee couldn't believe his eyes, he stared at Choi Siana questioning if this really was the same vice platoon leader. An awkward silence befell the two as Siana realized that she subconsciously showed her real personality to Lee. The scene then shifts and we see the two sitting awkwardly on a train ride. Siana turned her attention to Lee, and she asked if this wasn't Lee's first vacation in a while, and she expressed that Lee's parents must be happy to see him. Lee told her that neither of his parents are alive, and that they passed away when he was younger. Siana, realizing that her attempts to start a conversation had been shot down, shifted her gaze to the ground, 
and Lee quickly noticed that he had made things more awkward. With a pleasant smile Lee told Siana that he is all good, he explained that it was kinda hard and lonely when he was younger, but after becoming an adult, he found people who were just like family. Siana stared at Lee with a puzzled look, and she questioned what he means by just like family. Lee recalled a memory of all the people in his previous life who relied on him. Lee turned his head, and he contemplated if he should call them friends, co-workers, or comrades in arms. He gazed out the window, and he smiled, then he expressed that comrades in arms seems to be the right word. The train stopped at Yongyungpo, and Lee got out of the train. His vacation will last for four days and three nights. During this short vacation he must become fully prepared for the future. Lee smiled. Among those preparations, the first one is to get money. As he walked, he stopped, and he stared at a recruiting poster for the Blue Tree Guild. From what Lee knows, the owner of the Blue Tree Guild is already a multi-trillionaire at this point. He glared at the poster. Gordon Pracy, his black money moved underwater, and bought out high-ranking powerful people and hunter purchased items. Gradually, yet perfectly he took reign over everything. Humanity lost to the villains for several reasons, but at the core was money. Even if having as much money as Gordon is impossible, Lee thought he should at least have enough to not get swept up in his money game. Lee exited the train station, and he started making his way through the city. He knows about the important future events and where and when money will accumulate. Simply put, if he just invests before others do, even chump change can snowball. For that Lee wanted a person who wouldn't betray him during investments no matter what. He entered a building with a wooden sign that says Hope Guild. He made his way up the stairs with the thought of entrusting this crucial part to someone faithful and loyal even with the slightest promise. As he made his way up the stairs, a voice could be heard yelling at someone. The voice expressed angrily that this person shouldn't let things get physical. Hearing this conversation took Lee by surprise, and he started making his way slowly up the remaining stairs. Inside a room, we see a white-haired man who was holding another by the collar. The man with a green suit expressed to the white-haired man that not a lot of clients came in this month. The white-haired man told this person that he doesn't care about that shit. He expressed that master's a pushover, so all this person needs to do is pick up leftover jobs from others. The man with the green suit told the white-haired man that he has been trying hard to find work, but it's hard because the white-haired man rejects all of it. The white-haired man expressed that being a guard at an event isn't a job, because it's humiliating to his character. Lee entered the room, and the two people turned their attention to the door with a shocked look on their faces. Instantly after seeing Lee, the white-haired man recognized him. He approached calling Lee by his nickname, Tin Can Pilot and he expressed that it's been a long time since they last saw each other. Then in a flashback we see the white-haired man, Lee Wunchul, introducing himself to Lee after finding out that he was awakened. Lee, who was a loser at the time, was grateful to have someone talk to him, so he happily gave Wunchul his name. In the present, Lee glared at Wunchul, and he expressed that they weren't on good enough terms to greet each other nicely. He moved past Wunchul, and he approached the man in a green suit, Chialsu, and they exchanged a friendly greeting. She also then asked Lee why he was visiting all of the sudden. Wunchul, who was silent this entire time due to shock, turned his head to Lee, questioning if he ate his brains for lunch. He expressed that Lee must have forgotten his memories because he greeted him nicely. Lee turned his head, and he glared at Wunchul. This irritated Wunchul, and he angrily asked Lee if he wanted him to refresh his memory with the real deal. In another flashback we see Lee controlling a metal pen, a metal ruler, and a box cutter. The crowd that had gathered was disappointed that this was the limits of Lee's abilities. Wunchul, who was embarrassed by Lee, approached angrily, calling Lee a loser for his lame abilities. He was so angry by the fact that he was friendly with someone who is so trash that he hit Lee on the jaw. Lee fell to the ground and he held his jaw in shock. Afterwards Wunchul expressed that Lee should stop calling himself an awakened with those dumb powers, and if he catches Lee talking about being awakened then he will kill him. In the present Wunchul, a C-rank hunter, the Hope Guild's signature hunter with the fighter trait, started rolling up his sleeves. He called Lee by his nickname, Tin Can Pilot, and he asked if he should beat Lee up like back in their school days. He started approaching Lee, and he expressed that he will make him beg for his life as he used to do back then. She also got in between them, and he tried stopping Wunchul. However, Wunchul was boiling with rage at this point, and he asked Chialsu to leave the room, unless he wanted to die with Lee. Lee suddenly spoke, asking Wunchul to give it a try. This surprised Wunchul. He turned his attention to Lee questioning if he heard correctly. Lee glared at him with a cold expression, and he asked him to try and kill him if he could. This really ticked Wunchul off. He rushed at Lee calling him a son of a bitch. He threw a punch, however Lee didn't bother to move as Wunchul's fists were heading for his face. Wunchul stopped his assault after realizing that Lee had different swords and weapons aimed at him. Lee spoke in a cold tone, and he explained that he couldn't guarantee that today he will be able to beat Wunchul in a fight. But he assured him that he would at least be able to cripple him half to death, to the point he would think a whole army unit attacked him. 
He glared at Wunchul, and he told him that he could easily end his life as a close-range fighting hunter. Wunchul was taken aback. He stared at the weapons that Lim had aimed at him, and he realized that Lee could really do it if he wanted. Suddenly a man entered the room, expressing that he and Wunchul needed to leave right now, or they will be late to the event. Lee instantly dropped the weapons as this person entered the room. The man stared at the scene in front of him with a confused look on his face, and Lee started expressing loudly to Wunchul that he is so sorry, and that he will be careful next time. He hugged Wunchul by force, this confused Wunchul, he questioned why Lee was acting weird all of the sudden, and he tried to get Lee off him. Lee hugged Wunchul tighter, and he whispered in his ears saying he heard the White Tiger Guild kicked him out for peeing his pants and running away during his first raid. Wunchul was taken aback, and he questioned how Lee knew this, Lee continued on saying Wunchul should keep in mind that he also has a big mouth, and he asked him if he was going to pathetically fight an F-rank hunter in front of everyone he knows. Lee continued whispering with hostility in his voice, that he is saving the face that Wunchul is so fucking obsessed about, so while he was still being nice, he wanted Wunchul to get lost. Wunchul and the other person left, and the scene shifts into Chialsu's office, and we see the Lee and Chialsu discussing. Lee had placed the cards of the AMT, Anti-Monster Troop, and the Blue Flower Guild on the table in front of Chialsu. Chialsu, who was staring at some stocks on the stock market on his tablet, questioned if everything Lee said just now was true. He questioned if the stocks that Lee showed him were really going to skyrocket by the numbers he pointed out. Lee didn't answer, he just observed Chialsu with a smile. Chialsu shouted that if Lee was telling the truth, then this would be life-changing. The scene then shifts to in front of the Blue Tree Guild building, and we see six guards guarding the door. The person who picked up one chill from the Hope Guild building complained, questioning how much longer they would have to stand guard. Then he turned to Wunchul, questioning if they shouldn't try to raid a gate. This person saw Wunchul gritting his teeth in a rage, so he asked if something was wrong. Suddenly a businessman approached, expressing his distaste for the guards. He questioned why these servants were causing a ruckus in this reserved place. He stopped in front of Wunchul, and he said Wunchul must be the leader, so he told him he should have been watching Zone C, A, B, E, D. He placed his hand on Wunchul's shoulder, and he asked if Wunchul doesn't know the alphabet. He questioned how many times he has to explain things to Wunchul for him to get it, and he expressed that if Wunchul doesn't know how to read then he should at least work on his listening. Wunchul who had remained silent this entire time, suddenly uppercut the businessman. Afterwards he started using the man's face as a punching bag. Wunchul punched the businessman's face into the pavement. This sight sent the other guards into a panic, as they knew they couldn't stop Wunchul. Some time later Wunchul stopped assaulting the man, and he asked the guard who was talking to him earlier to search for someone for him. He expressed in a rage that he was going to kill that dipshit Lee. Then back at the Hope Guild, Park Chialsu the leader of the Hope Guild, found it hard to believe Lee. Chialsu is a hunter with the analyst class and is someone who'd go on to lead the rediscovery of rank F, and he is Lee's benefactor who found a way to boost his abilities. Lee thought Chialsu's reaction was a reasonable one, as anyone would find it hard to believe if you suddenly told them that you could help them make life-changing money. She also turned his attention to the recruitment cards that Lee had laid out on the table, and he questioned if the recruiters gave Lee this information to scout him. Lee replied with a question. He asked if Chialsu thinks he is trustworthy based on his actions so far. Chialsu was taken aback by this question, and he expressed that he trusts Lee without a doubt. Lee smiled. The source of this information is his past life, but he guessed that Chialsu would find that hard to believe. So Lee showed Chialsu text messages between him and Kangsiok. They were discussing the fact that Lee, an F-rank received an offer to become a commissioned officer, which is an unprecedented offer, and Kang Siok was urging Lee to make his decision quickly. She also grabbed the phone out of Lee's hand, and he glued his eyes to the text messages. With this it confirmed that Lee was telling the truth. Lee smiled and he handed Chialsu his card. He expressed that he wanted to entrust Chialsu with his investments. He explained that there was 20 million won in his account, and even though it's not a lot it's what his parents left behind for him. She also gently grabbed Lee's card, he expressed that Lee must have genuine faith in him, and he thanked Lee for that. Then in a flashback, we see Chi also confronting a crying Lee about his powers. She also told Lee that no one in this world is without talent, it's just that talent is now judged based on your awakened powers these days. He patted Lee on the back, and he expressed with a smile that Lee shouldn't beat himself up. He told him that they should live a little longer until their talents are recognized as superpowers too. In the present Lee held onto Chialsu's hand with a smile, this was his investment, a way of repaying someone he considers his brother for being the only warmth he received in his previous life when he had nothing. Lee knows that in the future humanity will encounter otherworldly beings who can communicate. The technology gained through interacting with these otherworldly beings will be a turning point in the gate war, so their skills will be vital in stopping the gates and waves that are to come. For that Lee needs an expert who can communicate with the otherworldly beings and pass on their technology to him. 
At the Yungyungpo, Blacksmith Alley, we see Lee asking a shopkeeper about the price for mana stones. The shopkeeper then asked how much Lee is willing to spend. After leaving the shop, Lee continued making his way through the back alley. The second thing he wanted to prepare for the future is to put himself in a situation where he would be able to create his first master grade item with the help of the seven dwarven artisans. As Lee made his way through the blacksmith alleys, he was being tailed by someone. However, he didn't notice as he was busy thinking about preoccupying blacksmiths, whose status went beyond artisan to master before villains realized it. He stopped at one of the blacksmith's workshop and he said hello to a blacksmith who was working on what looks like a broadsword. The blacksmith expressed in a rude tone that he is only selling what's on the shelves. So Lee shouldn't look at anything else, then he went back to hammering the broadsword. Lee quickly recognized the blacksmiths as artisan Kang Jiangdu, a blacksmith who was fired from the blacksmith's guild for his eccentricities, and it was blatantly obvious why. With an awkward expression on his face, Lee expressed that he would only look at what's on the shelves then. As he made his way over to the shelves, he observed Kang as he hammered the weapon he was currently working on. The weapon Kang was working on is a javelin made of Orihalcon, and although it looks crude and broad, it's the Dragon Slayer spear that would later be driven into the heart of the Dragon Terex. Seeing Kang working, Lee could see why the foundation for the first master grade item was laid in this ramshackle workshop. Suddenly a woman entered the workshop, and she approached Lee while expressing that a crusty is here today as well. Kang turned his attention to her, and he told her that she shouldn't be calling a customer crusty. However the woman didn't see the reason why she had to express a customer differently when Kang does the same thing. Lee turned his attention to her, the thought of seeing his comrade in arms, Master Blacksmith Kang Bixiao made him smile. Four years later upon the passing away of the artisan Kang Jiangu, she inherited all of his skills and became a master smith, surpassing even her master. Bixiao hunched over, and she used her ability to scan for the worth of Lee's long trench coat and Laurent boots. After seeing that the long trench coat was worth 1,500,000 won, and that the boots cost 1,600,000 she started rubbing her hands together, and she expressed that Lee wasn't crusty, she promoted him to a customer, and she asked if there is anything she could help him with. Lee smiled awkwardly he had forgotten how crazed Bixiao was over money. However, this suits a dwarf perfectly, and now that he had her attention, he questioned if he would be able to turn it to trust. With Bixiao's help, Lee picked out a bunch of metal that totaled 18 million won. This made Bixiao happy, and she promoted Lee from customer to boss. Kang was taken aback. From his observation, Lee shouldn't be a mage. He found this strange, and he questioned why Lee was buying poisonous magical metals and mistral tungsten alloy beads that he can't even handle. He questioned if Lee wasn't just wasting his money. Bixiel told her grandpa to pipe down, she expressed that Lee must have a place to use it, hence why he was purchasing it. Lee interrupted, saying this is all he needs, and he expressed that he would be back to buy more things often. Lee grabbed his stuff, and as he was leaving he expressed that he would be back when he needed something. Bixiao smiled and she asked Lee to come back often. As Lee was walking out of the workshop he apologized to Bixiao in his head, because unlike his other comrades in arms, he had no choice but to call Bixiao back to battle but this time he was determined to protect her at all costs. Later that night, outside a motel, we see the man that was following Lee earlier observed the motel from across the street. Inside one of the rooms in the motel, Lee picked up one of the medals he purchased from Kang, and he sat on the bed with his legs crossed, and he placed the medal in his mouth. Before the end of his vacation, it's a must that he significantly increase his poison resistance and metal weight he can manipulate. He received a message from the system that informed him that the metal he just ate was enchanted with poison. There was 20 minutes left till absorption, and after absorption his tolerance to poison will increase by a small amount. Normally this would have taken the same time as mentioned by the system, however he now has the breath room. He activated the ability, and the metal quickly melted in his stomach. He activated the breath room at 250% efficiency. This triggered multiple notifications from the system warning him that he will be inflicted with severe pain. The warning notifications kept coming. This irritated Lee. He held his stomach because of the pain and he expressed out loud that he knows already. The pain increased severely. Lee held onto the bed sheets tightly. He didn't have much time before the soul station gate, so he must eat all of the metal he purchased and endure the pain that came with it. Two days later, the man that was tailing Lee brought Wanchul to the motel Lee was using. He expressed that he didn't know what Lee was doing, and he explained that Lee locked himself in there for two days. Inside the room, we see that Lee had finished all of the medals he purchased, and suddenly he received a message from the system. Lee reached tier 2 poison resistance, and he was able to absorb all of the metal he ingested, so his current controllable metal weight is 17,500 grams, and his metal detection ability has been increased. He could now detect up to 500 grams of metal from up to 135 meters away. Lee got up from the bed, feeling empowered by his growth. 
Then he turned his attention to the message from the system. Even though tier 2 poison resistance was lower than he expected, he was happy because his current controllable weight would allow him to carry about 60 combat knives. The system then congratulated him for successfully passing the first latent breakthrough, and because of this Lee gained a trait skill. The system pulled up the information for the new skill Lee learnt, Metal Smash. It is a D-rank skill, and it consumes mana to crush a certain amount of metal. The amount of mana consumed varies depending on the amount of metal the skill is applied to. Lee thought this was a powerful skill since it could destroy metal. He smiled, since with this skill he can disarm almost any piece of equipment in one fell swoop. So even though he was disappointed about his poison resistance, the fact that he acquired this skill is good enough. Suddenly Wunchul broke down the door to his room, however Lee wasn't in the least bit surprised. Wunchul was taken aback by Lee's brazen act. Lee quickly realized why Wunchul was here. He spoke explaining to Wunchul that he is a soldier, so there's countless restrictions governing his actions, and he asked him if he could just go back. Wunchul started laughing. He smiled then he charged at Lee, while expressing that Lee is just yapping because he knows that he is going to die. He threw a punch, however Lee activated his body strengthening skill, and he stopped Wunchul's punch with ease. Wunchul was surprised, and he questioned how Lee's hand was able to stop him so easily. Lee asked him if they could take this outside, since at this rate civilians will get caught up in this. The civilians in the motel were already brought out of their rooms by the commotion. Lee's arrogance continued to piss Wunchul off, he retracted his fist, and he tried to kick Lee, while expressing that Lee should stop bluffing. Lee dodged the kick by ducking, and he expressed that two days ago, his arrogance might have been a bluff, but not today, he activated his body strengthening on his right arm, and he charged up an uppercut. Then he delivered a devastating blow to Wunchul's gut, Wunchul lost control of his legs and he fell to the ground due to the pain. Lee towered over him with a cold expression on his face, he told Wunchul that this is nothing compared to what he did to him, so he asked why Wunchul was going this far. Wunchul turned his evil gaze to Lee, and he expressed that Lee is getting cocky after getting lucky enough to land one blow on him. Wunchul started charging up an ability in his legs, and he told Lee that he shouldn't look at him with those eyes. Lee shouted at Wunchul, reminding him that civilians could get hurt if they stayed there and fought. However, Wunchul expressed that he couldn't care less about the civilians. This irritated Lee. He knew that Wunchul was only after him, so he turned his attention to the window, and he realized that there is only one way to minimize the shock to the building. So he dashed for the window, this infuriated Wunchul, and he shouted at Lee questioning why he was running away, as Lee was about to jump out of the window. Wunchul finished charging his ability and he kicked Lee, luckily Lee was able to block in time, however the force of the attack sent him flying through the window. Wunchul quickly jumped out of the same spot, and he expressed angrily that he was going to kill Lee. While falling to the ground Lee noticed that Wunchul was planning to kick him, he activated the body strengthening skill on his feet, then he chained it with metal control, and he moved himself out of the way of Wunchul's attack. This left Wunchul questioning how Lee was able to change direction in mid-air. Following this Lee moved himself with the skill chain, and he landed safely on the ground. He took this moment to observe the skill chain he just used. At the moment he couldn't fly as freely as in his previous life, however by chaining the skill body strengthening and metal control, he could control his body as much as he wanted. Suddenly Wunchul appeared behind him, preparing to end him with a downward kick, Lee quickly noticed, and in that moment, Wunchul expressed that even though the military gave Lee some cheap buffs, that was all it was, useless and petty tricks. Lee acted quickly and he moved himself out of the way of Wunchul's attack using the skill chain, however Wunchul's attack sent shock waves through the building, and the civilians who had grown concerned peered out their window questioning why hunters were in the middle of a battle. Wunchul, whose blood was still boiling, turned to Lee, he crouched over, and he asked if Lee was just going to continue dodging like a rat. Suddenly he rushed at Lee again, and he shouted that Lee should come at him like before, he launched a fury of kicks, which Lee was able to skillfully dodge. Wunchul's strong kicks were kicking up a strong gust of wind that moved the cars nearby, and shook the structure of the motel. The civilians inside started to panic, they all ran outside their rooms, and since hunters were causing a ruckus, one of the civilians reported it. Lee continued to skillfully dodge Wunchul's kicks while trying to minimize the damage. Many civilians were watching, and as a military officer, he couldn't just counter Wunchul's attack fiercely. And if innocent people got dragged into this, it could ruin his plans for the Seoul Station Gate. Wunchul suddenly stopped his fury of kicks, and he turned his attention to the civilians who were still stuck in their rooms, and were recording the situation. Wunchul questioned if Lee was avoiding him because there were a lot of eyes on them, so he decided to just get rid of the nuisance. He charged up an attack aimed at the motel. Lee stood in front of the building with his arms open, and he questioned if Wunchul really planned on destroying the entire motel just to fight him, and he asked Wunchul if he realized that there were innocent civilians still in the motel. 
He shouted that those people have nothing to do with him. Wunchul shouted back, and he expressed that the people in the building do have something to do with Lee. He rushed at Lee, while explaining that Lee and everyone in the motel pissed him off. Then he told Lee that he could dodge the attack, but if he was really desperate to save the people in the motel then he would stop him. This really ticked Lee off. A ring of mana formed around his pupils. He gritted his teeth and in a tone of anger, he told Wunchul that he shouldn't have done this. He expressed that he will now put an end to Wunchul's life as a hunter. Lee activated the new skill he learnt recently, Metal Crush, and two interlocking mana rings appeared around Wunchul's leg, crushing it to bits. Wunchul fell to the ground, he held his leg, and he started screaming because of the pain. Lee approached slowly with a cold expression on his face, and Wunchul started crawling backwards. He questioned what leaded to him, and he demanded Lee stay away from him. Lee questioned Wunchul again, asking why he was going this far. Wunchul was confused by Lee's question. He explained that if a mosquito annoys him, then it's only fair that he kills it off. Lee was skeptical. He was sure that there is a reason why someone like Wunchul who got kicked out of a pack of wolves, was snarling earlier. He expressed angrily that rascals like Wunchul who are drunk on a superiority complex don't deserve to be hunters, because from his experience they always turn out to be villains. Wunchul shouted that a piece of shit like Lee couldn't do anything to him, so he should stop acting like he is all that. Lee motioned his finger up, and suddenly a piece of metal was sticking to the back of Wunchul's neck. Then Lee expressed with a cold expression on his face that if Wunchul ever showed his face in front of him again, then he wouldn't just end it by taking a leg like he did this time. Lee's threats terrified Wunchul, and Lee, while doing his best to hold his anger back, continued on saying that Wunchul should thank God he was a military officer. In his head Lee confirmed to himself that not killing Wunchul is the correct move, since he couldn't let this chance to save his comrade and take revenge on villains be taken away by someone like Wunchul. At dawn the authorities arrived, and they took Lee and Wunchul in for questioning. At the awakened task force building, Lee testified that he was simply trying to stop Wan Chol. The man who was questioning Lee accepted this, as it was consistent with the witness's statement. But Wan Chol is problematic and vicious, so he questioned how Lee was able to get so lucky as to survive. The man expressed that this is his first time as a police officer, seeing a low-ranking hunter get out of a fight with a higher-ranked hunter without so much as a scratch. Lee expressed with an awkward expression that he got lucky, and he only survived thanks to Wan Chol's armor suddenly bursting open. With this the man was done questioning Lee, meaning he was free to go. Lee quickly made his way outside the station. For all of his life he thought being an F-rank was a shitty label, but he didn't expect it would help him avoid suspicion. After Lee left, one of the workers came running to the man who was questioning Lee. This person asked the man to look at something. He reported that Wunchul's armor had no durability issues or mana overturn. The man grabbed the report, and he started reading through it in disbelief. If it wasn't the case the Wunchul's armor malfunctioned, then he questioned if this person was saying an F-rank crushed a C-rank's armor and took him down without a scratch. The man couldn't believe it as it made no sense. Outside the station Lee crouched down, and in a burst of speed, he quickly moved through the city. As he made his way through the city we could see from his face that he was deep in thought. Then in a flashback we see Lee in a hospital reacting to a breaking news. The news presenter reported that the death toll of citizens stranded at the gate of Seoul Station, which began at 15.20 today, has been confirmed at 745 so far. Except for the first, second, and third wave, this was a monster disaster unlike one humanity had ever seen before. Lee continued to stare at the TV in disbelief, and the news presenter continued on reporting that the Seoul Station tragedy has increased the criticism from hunter experts and civil society organizations, who are raising questions about the fundamental limitations and problems with the current gate response system. In the present, Lee continued heading for Seoul Station at top speed. He was a bit concerned because unlike the previous two gates, he had no first-hand experience with the gate opening today, meaning his information on variables that may appear are limited. He stopped at the entrance of Seoul Station, which was extra busy. Lee knows because of his memories of the future that of all of the monster disasters, the Seoul Station disaster was one of the worst. Lee arrived at 1516, and he couldn't help but question if he would be able to handle this gate with his current progress. He entered Seoul Station, and because of how packed it was, part of him wanted to go on a rampage and evacuate the general population, however there were guards present who would question him, so that was out of the picture. Also he knows that there is a villain hiding in the crowd here, and if things go wrong, and the villain goes into hiding, then he will never find the turning point that changes the future. He stood in the middle of the crowd, and he took a deep breath in. Then he turned his attention to a clock. There was two minutes left before the gate opened. Suddenly a familiar voice could be heard calling out to Lee. This surprised him. After catching up to Lee, Siana crouched over and she placed her hands on her knees. And she started catching her breath. She told Lee she had been looking for him for a long time. 
The appearance of Siana took Lee by surprise and he wondered why she was here. Siana informed Lee that she heard he went to the police station and that the whole unit was going crazy. Lee with a puzzled look on his face questioned how Siana knew he was here. Siana reminded Lee that he told her he had plans at Seoul Station on his last vacation day. But she questioned why he wasn't picking up his phone. Lee was confused. In his previous life, Siana wasn't here, and he questioned if this was happening because he changed the past. He told Siana that he wasn't responding because his phone got crushed. Then he turned his attention to a clock. There was only one minute left before one of the worst gates in the world opened. Siana then asked Lee to give her the reason why he was taken into the station. Lee looked at her. There was no time for him to dilly-dally, and from now on he must stick to his plan. The one minute was up, and Lee quickly took off the bag he was carrying, and he dropped it on the floor, and metal spheres came spilling out. The metal spheres tripped the crowd of people who were walking by. They shouted at Lee questioning if he was a madman, and they explained to him, while shouting that he couldn't just spill stuff at the dead center of Seoul Station. Siana was highly concerned at this point. First Lee wasn't answering her when she was talking, and now he was acting strange. Lee looked upwards, towards the ceiling of Seoul Station, and he told Siana to run and find a gas mask when he gave the signal. This really confused Siana, and she looked at Lee with a concerned look questioning what was wrong with him. The crowd of people who were disoriented by the metal spheres started maneuvering through them, and suddenly they were hit with a strong gust of purple wind. Just outside of the Seoul Station building, we see a mother and a daughter saying their goodbyes. The daughter questioned why her mother was asking her to leave so much, and she expressed that she wanted to watch her get on the train. With a smile the mother told her daughter that she doesn't want her to get tired. The daughter asked if her mom isn't sad, she told her that they don't even know when they will be able to see each other again. As the two discuss, a black veil started encircling the Seoul Station building. However, because of their conversation, they didn't notice. The mother was about to tell her daughter when they will be able to see each other again. But the black veil quickly finished encircling the Seoul Station building. In a shock, the daughter fell to the ground, and she stared at the black ball that had formed calling out to her mom. A six-hour timer and a prompt appeared on top of the black circle that had formed around Seoul Station. It was a new event and an unlucky one that had occurred in this zone. One could enter the zone, but cannot leave. The entry level restriction is level 15, and it will be imposed strictly on the zone. And the only way to escape is to survive for six hours or defeat the boss monster. Inside the building, a purple gate appeared on the ceiling, and a spider-like monster stuck its head out of the gate. Seeing this Lee took off running, and he gave Siana the signal to go and find a gas mask. The monster appeared fully out of the gate, and it started terrorizing the civilians. In the chaos of the civilians running away, Lee stopped. Then he stopped Siana, and he told her that she should get to safety first, and find a gas mask from the passenger aid station. Siana gritted her teeth, she reminded Lee that she was a soldier as well, and this time she didn't intend to survive by cowering. Since she wasn't a combat-type soldier, she informed Lee that she will be in the back evacuating civilians and treating the wounded. She had no idea what Lee was trying to do, but based on his results from the past missions she decided to trust him, and she commanded Lee as his platoon leader to stay alive at all costs. Lee smiled, and he expressed that he planned on following her orders. Back at the military, inside one of the higher-up's office, one of the executives was questioning Kang Siok's recent advocation for Lee. The executive questioned if Kang Siok really planned on commissioning a lowly soldier ranked at F as an officer. Kang Siok referred to this person as Brigadier General, and he expressed that he doesn't believe that the assessment of talent is important. In his belief, to be an outstanding officer shouldn't be limited to the mechanical grading of a hunter's rank. This left the Brigadier General questioning Kang Siok. So Kang Siok explained that the ranks are not tied to a hunter's level. It is merely a basic metric assigned at the hunter training center as per the expected outcome of a trait, and their aptitude in a raid fight, and for effectiveness in real-life battle. But as players leveled up, the military has been forced to adjust their ranks, in spite of this fact undervalued skills are dying on the field. Choi yun the 3rd Amp Brigade Brigadier General, through his casting of large-scale magic, he single-handedly proved that he possesses military force rivaling a tactical weapon. He is in a rank hunter, rank 31st in Korea, and that same man questioned if Kang Siok was trying to educate him right now. Kang Siok trembled, and he replied saying he wasn't. yun told Kang Siok that all veterans are joining civil guilds, and he questioned if anyone would apply to the amp if Kang Siok commissions a lowly F-rank soldier as an officer. In a serious tone he questioned if Kang Siok was saying something was wrong with the military system, and he expressed out of concern that Kang Siok might as well be going around shouting that the amp needs to be done away with. Kang Siok lowered his head, and his hat covered his disappointed face. yun continued on saying that Kang Siok must have seen something in that guy Lee. However, an insect is still an insect. At that moment, yun received a call on his office phone. 
he picked up the call, and he received a report that a gate appeared within the 1st Battalion's post area. The person reporting expressed that the gate opened in Seoul Station, and on top of that it's an unlucky event. This took Yun Jiol and Kang Seok by surprise. The scene then shifts to inside Seoul Station, and we see three guards using the flamethrower rune on the spider-like monster that came out of the gate. The monster turned its attention to one of the guards that was distracted. The guard had turned his attention to the team leader, and he was questioning what type of monster this was. He had never seen one of these in the field guide before. The monster quickly moved through the fire, and it prepared to pierce the distracted guard with its sharp leg. Luckily the team leader noticed, and he started making his way over to save the guard. The team leader was able to move the guard out of harm's way. However, the guard passed out in the process. Joan Manhu, a C-rank veteran hunter with the gladiator trait, and Soul Station Group 2's team leader took out a shield and a short sword. He expressed to the others that fire attacks won't work, and he ordered the other guards to switch to a frost rune so they could bind the monster's legs. The guards quickly started switching to a frost rune, and before the monster was able to attack Manhu, they were able to bind its legs. Taking into account the monster's size Manhu knew that the frost bind wouldn't last long, and he wanted to at least take out the monster's eyes before it broke free. He rushed at the monster while shouting for his team members to keep up the frost attack so he could go in an attack by himself. He jumped over the monster's head, however as he was charging up to attack the monster's eye, the monster looked up at him. Then it suddenly broke free from the bind skill, and it opened its mouth so Manhu would fall right in. Manhu quickly lifted his shield, covering his chest and head, and suddenly the metal spheres that Lee had spilled earlier started flying at Manhu. The spheres hit Manhu's shield, moving him out of the way of the monster's mouth. This shocked the monster, and it turned its attention to the direction where the spheres came from, and Lee approached the monster with a determined aura about him. He had many concerns however this wasn't the moment for him to be doubting himself. He activated the metal smash skill and an aura ring formed around his pupils. An aura ring also formed around the monster's torso as the skill was activating. The monster's armor required more mana for it to be completely crushed and as Lee poured mana into the skill he received notifications warning him about his rapid mana depletion. Lee continued on and with 76% of his mana left, he was able to completely crush the armor off what seems to be the monster's abdomen. This left Manhu and the other soldiers completely shocked, and Lee started to get more confident in the thought that with his current power he could stop this gate. He smiled menacingly because not only could he stop this gate, he can have the rewards for clearing this gate all to himself. The injured monster stumbled around, and after getting its bearings it stood and it let out a battle cry. Lee, with a grin, used metal control to manipulate some of the metal spheres he spilled all over Soul Station, and he expresses to the monster that it could howl all at once since he will squeeze out and devour the very last bit of temper the monster has left in it. He sent the metal spheres in, and as the spheres hit the monster's exposed weak spot, Lee expressed that it was time to see if the monster's insides were as hard as steel too. The metal spheres struck deep in the monster's exposed flesh, and using metal spin, Lee spun the metal spheres at high speeds. The monster screamed out in pain as the metal spheres grinded their way to its insides. Lee laughed, and he asked the monster to tell him how it feels to have its insides be grounded like it was in a blender. The monster screamed out in pain one last time, and suddenly afterwards it fell to the ground beside Lee. Man who was in a state of shock, the entire garrison of guards couldn't lay a finger on that monster, yet Lee killed it single-handedly. On top of that, in his countless raids, he had seen many a rank hunters, however never has he met anyone who is this laid back. He wondered if this was the power of an S-rank hunter that is mentioned in stories. The villain who was still hidden was ticked off, he spoke to himself questioning who this bastard was that was ruining his quest by appearing out of nowhere. Man who approached Lee, and he introduced himself, he then asked Lee if he was perhaps an S-rank hunter. Lee, who was looking up at the gate, told Manhu that he shouldn't lower his guard so quickly. This confused Manhu, so Lee explained while still looking up at the gate, that the first wave wasn't over yet. Manhu turned his attention to the gate, and to his horror two spider-like monsters, like the first one appeared from the gate. Lee looked up with his signature evil grin, he no longer had any doubts, as the battle with that monster made it certain. The soul station gate, he will be the one to stop it. He lifted two fingers up, and he motioned the metal spheres to attack. Outside the black veil we see that the AMT was quick to arrive, and shortly after arriving the team leaders of the 1st and 3rd battalion quickly assembled their team into groups. The Blue Flower Guild had also arrived, and they looked onwards as the members of the AMT assembled. One of the Blue Flower Guild members, a knight, recalled his military days as he observed the AMT. 
a mage approached the knight, questioning why they couldn't just gather all the mage players and use battering magic to smash the black veil around Soul Station. The knight expressed in a serious tone that they couldn't. He explained to the mage that the black veil is not magic. It's a rule created by the system, and there's no way to bypass it unless you override the system. So for now all they could do is wait for the time to pass. Some time later two helicopters could be seen flying over the black veil. Out in front was a military helicopter, and closely behind it was a blue flower guild's helicopter. The helicopters landed a distance away, and out of them came Kangsiok and Catherine. As the two approached their members, Kangsiok asked Catherine if the Blue Flower Guild had any hunters below level 15. Catherine turned her attention to Kangsiok, and in a shocked tone she asked Kangsiok if he thinks the number one guild would have hunters like that, and she questioned if Kangsiok is really planning on sending a rescue team inside. She asked if those hunters wouldn't be walking into their death. Kangsiok continued walking with a stoic look about him. He took off his glasses, and he expressed to Catherine that there are over 800 people inside Soul Station. And he questioned how Catherine is able to think about prioritizing the hunters' lives in this situation. Suddenly his tone shifted, he turned his gaze forward, and he told Catherine that the military has a trump card inside the Black Veil. Inside the Black Veil, Lee had focused his attention on one of the monsters. He activated the Metal Smash skill, crushing the armor on the abdomen on the monster. While he was distracted the other monster tried a sneak attack on him, however Lee quickly noticed. He activated the Body Strengthening skill, and he used Metal Control to move himself away. However this monster was relentless, so while moving away from it using the chain skill, he turned to the guards and he asked them to freeze the monster like before. Manu quickly got on it, and he ordered the other guards to use the frost rune. The guards blasted the monster with frost attacks, freezing its legs and rendering it immobile. However the other monster crawled on the wall, and it quickly made its way to an unsuspecting guard. It lunged at the guard, preparing to bite her head off. Lee noticed, he activated metal control, while expressing to the monster that it shouldn't get distracted. He shot the metal spheres into the cracks in the monster's armor, and he explained that he was their opponent. The monster fell to the ground, and the guard was able to get away safely. Afterwards Lee used metal spin, grinding into the monster like the first one. The monster screamed out in pain, and shortly after it died. Seeing this enraged the other monster, and it started breaking through the ice that had formed on its body. Lee, with his signature grin, asked the monster if it was finally awake. He told it to calm down, since he would be sending it to the same place as its friend. To flex Lee used the skill Metal Smash to kill the monster in one hit, however his mana dropped from 63% to 39%. The villain, who was still hidden, observed in disbelief, in his head there's no way a player of this caliber would use a subway or train, so he questioned why a guy like this is in Soul Station of all places. As he thought more about it he got furious, as he didn't expect he would end up failing his first mission like this. The villain then received a message from the system, informing him that he has failed to achieve the following goal for his main quest. The villain couldn't bide his time so the venomous ironclad spiders at gate 1 could nest inside Soul Station. As the villain is currently only a villain candidate, his reward for completing this quest would be a promotion to official villain. He is then warned that once he has accepted the quest it will be game over if he doesn't complete it properly. The villain started to panic as he was running out of time. He shifted his gaze towards the civilians that were in hiding. Man who called out to the other guards, and since it looked like the first wave of the gate was over, he ordered them to gather around. Afterwards he thanked Lee, expressing that they wouldn't have been able to stop the first wave on their own. Lee seemed like a high-level ranked hunter, so he asked Lee if he could tell them his name. Lee remained silent, he just glared at the guards that had gathered in front of him, almost like he was looking for something. This really confused the guards, and they stared at each other with a puzzled look on their faces, questioning if they did something wrong. The female guard that Lee saved earlier held her cheek, and she started to blush as Lee's gaze shifted onto her for a moment. Manhu, who was concerned, approached Lee questioning if something was wrong. After getting a good look at all the guards' faces, Lee's expression shifted. The villain wasn't here trying to blend in with the guards, this disappointed him as he heard the villain was a guard in his previous life. Suddenly Siana came running while calling out to Lee, Lee turned his attention to her with a shocked expression, as he had completely forgotten about Siana. Siana spoke to Lee, referring to him as vice platoon leader, and she asked him if all the civilians had been evacuated. Hearing Siana refer to Lee as vice platoon leader really shocked man who as S rank players are supposed to be exempt from military service. This is because the country can't control them. Siana told Lee that because the spiders were so huge, she divided the civilians into small groups and evacuated them by putting each into a room with a narrow passageway. And luckily there were no serious injuries. After this she asked Lee if it was really true that he stopped the first wave. She then demanded that he report every detail of what happened. This left Lee with a distraught expression on his face, and before he could get a word out Manhu suddenly asked him for his rank. 
Lee's expression changed again, this time he looked annoyed. He knew that he didn't have enough time to answer all of their questions, so in a serious tone he told them that their questions aren't important right now, because he believed this might be a double gate. This concerned Sionha and Manhu, and as they racked their brains for what to do next, Lee looked around with an irritable look on his face. If they were to start searching through the 800 civilians here, it's highly likely that the villain would be able to hide himself. If things were to go wrong, and the second wave begins, the villain would get a second chance, and since this was the case it's a must that he stays four steps ahead of him. Outside the Black Veil, Kang Siok spoke to Minhee, expressing that he was appointed as the field commanding officer of the Seoul Station Rescue Operation. Minhee understood his assignment, and he pledged to complete his mission. The members of the rescue team started talking amongst themselves, questioning if Minhee wasn't a C-rank hunter, and if he was they wondered why he was below level 15. This really ticked Minhee off, he turned his head to his team members and he glared at them with a death stare. Kang Siok intervened, expressing that everyone should be focused in moments like this. In a small speech, Kang Siok told the soldiers that it's with a heavy heart that he is sending his low-level troops into what would most likely be their deaths, however the lives of the civilians depend on the rescue team, so as soldiers they must protect the civilians. He questioned if the soldiers understood this, and Minhee and the other soldiers shouted that they did. And as the rescue team was departing, Kang Siok told Minhee that he should actively incorporate Lee's input into the operation once they had made contact with him. This shocked Minhee, and he questioned why he would have to incorporate Lee's inputs when he was in charge of the rescue team. Inside the Black Veil, Lee left the group to look for the double gate, he found it underneath some stairs. Inside the double gate, the villain who was trying to use the double gate to further his mission, was faced with a skeleton monster. He received a message from the system, informing him that he wouldn't be attacked by monsters in this area. However, as he stared at the skeleton bones in front of him, he questioned why all the skeleton monsters weren't moving. He questioned if this is what the system means by will not attack. He then pulled up his quest information. His first quest was to bide his time until the venomous ironclad spider at gate 1 could nest, but he failed in doing so. His second quest is to kill 500 civilians by any means necessary. This quest is still ongoing. The villain's third and final quest is to deliver the item received from the elite monster, Evil Seeker to the Villain Alliance. This quest too was still ongoing. The villain stared at his quest list, and he calmed himself, he repeated to himself that he should just bear with it, because if he is able to complete this quest he will be promoted to a regular villain. This was a life-changing quest that other players will never get, so he reminded himself that he should stay calm. As he was racking his brain to think of what to do next, he noticed that metal spheres were heading in his direction. He took out an item, and tree roots quickly appeared from the ground, and shielded him from the metal spheres. Afterwards he questioned what this person that attacked him was doing here, and he explained that he was a railway guard. This person, Lee, who had more metal spheres, suspended in the air using metal control, stood at the entrance of the cave. He exposed the villain's plan, expressing that he must have been planning to hide among the citizens, while waiting for the guards to get massacred during the first wave. And in case there were more players among the citizens, the villain would use his guard uniform to avoid suspicion, and then slaughter them. He questioned how hard the villain had to rack his brain to come up with this plan. Lee then called the villain, Yang Jusip, by his name and he expressed that it's been a while since they last met. This left Jusip in a daze, he lowered the roots that had protected him slightly, and he peeked through the small opening that was created, and he stared at Lee with a shocked expression. He lowered his guard further, and he asked how Lee knew of him. Jusip is a B-rank villain candidate, with the cannibal tree ability, and Lee knows that he is a future or rank hunter that climbed to the top. Jusip's nickname in the future is Black Tentacle. Lee smiled, and he expressed in an irritable tone that, he knows Jusip quite well, and he called him a fucking villain. This got Jusip to lift his guard, he expressed that he doesn't know who Lee is, but he shouldn't be using the word villain out loud. Jusip guessed that Lee was an A-rank hunter, and since he saw Lee's ability to manipulate metal, he used the roots to attack Lee. And as the roots headed towards Lee, Jusip reminded Lee that no matter his rank there is something called compatibility. He expressed that Lee's metal spheres wouldn't be able to do anything to him. In a glimpse of the future, we see Jusip, who had spread his roots throughout the city. Using the roots, he drained the life force of the citizens, and as he made his way through the city, he called out to Lee, questioning if he was just going to continue to hide. He asked Lee if he was just going to stand by and watch as his cannibal tree ability slaughters and devours all of the citizens. In the future Jusip had risen to a rank and was now working under the name Black Tentacle, and because of his cannibal tree ability he quickly rose the ranks and became number one. Lee, who was hiding because he had been injured, listened with an angry expression on his face as Jusip went around asking if he was all talk. In the present Lee smiled, and he told Jusip that he is well aware that his metal abilities wouldn't be able to do much against him. 
He activated body strengthening on his feet, and he used metal control to move himself out of the way of Jusip's attack. Lee's odd movements surprised Jusip, and he questioned how Lee was suddenly able to move like that. Using the skill chain Lee suddenly rushed at Jusip. This made Jusip question if Lee wasn't a ranged type hunter, like him. While he ran at Jusip, Lee used his metal control ability to shoot some of the metal spheres at Jusip. Jusip quickly blocked the attack, and he shot multiple roots at Lee, and Lee used a skill chain to move himself over the roots. Jusip couldn't understand why Lee was running at him. He thought that there was no way Lee's metal sphere attacks would work on him, so he questioned why Lee was recklessly running towards him. He thought maybe Lee had gone mad. While he was distracted Lee fired more metal spheres at Jusip's blind spot. Jusip noticed in time and he blocked the attack. In the safety of his protective barrier made of roots, he called Lee a moron, and he expressed that Lee could attack him all he wants since none of his attacks would work. Lee finally landed on the protective wall of roots and with a menacing grin. He expressed that Jusip's wall should be enough firewood. Jusip started laughing. He asked Lee if he thought he could do something when he got close enough, and he expressed that Lee has no idea about his power. He told Lee that his ability is the cannibal tree, and it will chew off Lee's arms and digest them before Lee can do anything about it. The tree barrier protecting Jusip extended branches that quickly wrapped around Lee's hands like a snake. Lee grinned harder, and fumes started emitting from his mouth. He activated body strengthening on his hand, stopping the cannibal tree from devouring his hands. Jusip who was clueless, had a confused look on his face, and he wondered why the tree wasn't digesting Lee's arms already. Lee opened his mouth, and flames started gathering in his mouth. Jusip quickly took notice of the flames, and he questioned why flames were appearing in Lee's mouth out of the blue. As the flames collected and Lee's mouth grew larger, Jusip told Lee that he was in the middle of a quest, and if Lee spared his life, then he would give Lee all the reward items for the unlucky event. Jusip smiled. He thought this was great thinking on his part, and he thought Lee wouldn't refuse his offer since he was offering to give him all of the rewards. Jusip continued on saying that he was on a quest buff, so he was certain that he could clear the gate with no effort. In fact, he made a promise that he could. Lee called bullshit, and as the flames spewed from his mouth he told Jusip that he used the same trick in his previous life when they faced off too. This left Jusip puzzled as he tried to wrap his mind around what Lee meant by previous life. Lee told Jusip that he should just die, and he released the flames he collected in his mouth like a flamethrower skill. The flames quickly burnt through the wood from Jusip's cannibal ability, engulfing in flames. Outside the Black Veil, Minnie and the rescue team approached the Black Veil preparing to enter. Before they did, Minnie told the rescue team that they should get their act together since they wouldn't know what kind of gate opened inside Soul Station. Minnie took a deep breath in, and he entered the Black Veil, and as the other soldiers entered after him, they were warned by the system that they were entering a dangerous zone, and once they entered they wouldn't be able to leave unless certain conditions were met. Being the first one to enter, Minnie took shelter behind the pillars and he directed the soldiers to take shelter and hold their positions. Jumu quickly rushed in, and after seeing the situation he gasped, he shouted that there was a huge spider. Then he whispered to him, telling him to shut up, and Junmo quickly covered his mouth. Suddenly someone called out questioning what that was just now. This shocked Minhee. He spoke saying they were the AMT's rescue team. Man who emerged from one of the pillars holding up the structure of Soul Station, with a shocked expression. Minhee ordered the soldiers to set up a perimeter and he started questioning Manhu. The first question Minhee asked was why there were no civilians around, and he asked Manhu to explain the situation. Man who explained that thanks to an AMT member they were able to evacuate the civilians to a safe area, and he expressed that even now they are following the orders of that AMT member. Minnie then overwhelmed Man who with questions, he asked if that member was a woman, and if so he questioned where she was and if she was hurt. Man who was confused, he explained to Minnie that the female soldier is safe, and she is the one controlling matters at the temporary shelter right now. Man who explained that the one he was talking about was someone named Lee, and right now they were following his orders. Hearing this made Minhee he grit his teeth in anger. Junmo cut in, and he asked Manhu if the soldier he was talking about had spiked hair, and if could sometimes be seen with a sinister smile on his face. Manhu replied that Junmo is correct, and Junmo in an excited tone, told Minhee that it must be Corporal Lee. Minhee interrupted. In a tone of anger he told Junmo to stay still, and he asked him if he didn't know his place. The way Minhee was speaking to Junmo shocked Manhu. Junmo pouted, and he apologized even though he didn't want to. Minhee then turned to Manhu, and he told him that Lee was an F-rank hunter, and since he was a C-rank hunter, he would be in command now. Manhu lowered his head, and he questioned how Minhee was able to enter this place. He reminded Minhee that there was a level restriction of 15, meaning Minhee was below level 15 like them, so he shouldn't be speaking like someone who is vastly stronger. After hearing this Minhee was at a loss for words. Manhu lifted his head, and as he glared at Minhee, he expressed that he was already aware of Lee's rank 
but he is willing to comply with his orders because he witnessed firsthand that Lee is completely worthy of being in command. He told Minnie that he was a C-rank hunter as well, and using his logic he questioned why he had to follow his orders when they are the same rank, and since Minnie called himself the captain of the rescue team, he questioned how Minnie plans of rescuing them and the other civilians. Minnie started to explain hesitantly that he and his team will build a barricade at the entrance with a narrow passageway, there they would bide their time for as long as possible. Minnie was interrupted by Siana, who came running to inform Manhu that they were in big trouble. Minnie quickly approached her, he grabbed her by the shoulders asking if she was hurt anywhere. Siana was shocked to see Minnie, and she questioned why he was here. Minnie tried to explain that he was here to rescue her, however Siana quickly moved past him. She expressed that his explanation wasn't important, and he told Manhu that the civilians have realized that this is a double gate. This took Manhu by surprise, and at the temporary shelter, the civilians approached the guards, questioning why they would hide the fact that this was a double gate from them. The female guard that Lee saved earlier explained that they did this to avoid causing chaos. However, the civilians questioned why they should trust the guards, they remarked that that guard was right, and they questioned if the guards were just using the civilians as human shields to buy time. The female guard was confused, and she asked the civilians where they got that idea from, and one of the civilians explained that the guard with the scar on his nose told them the truth. Inside the other gate Jusip, who had half his body burnt, and was barely alive, remarked that he made full preparations for this quest. He didn't think it was fair because this opportunity was so hard for him to get. Lee questioned why Jusip was grumbling. He expressed that he was busy so Jusip should hurry up and die. And to aid Jusip he attacked him with the metal spheres, killing him. Lee was tired of this shit, and he questioned why all these damn villains have the same damn repertoire. Suddenly bright light filled the cave, and a strong gust of wind started to blow. Lee quickly covered his face, and he stared in the direction of the source of the wind. He noticed that a gate was opening, and after the gate fully opened two female angels flew down, one with red hair and another with blonde hair. And as the angels flew around him, Lee received messages from the system informing him that he is rapidly recovering his health and mana. And shortly after he received another message that informed him that a quest had arrived for him. This message made Lee grin. A system window appeared in front of Lee. The window contained all of the information for the hidden quest light bearer. Lee stopped the conspiracy of the betrayer of mankind, a villain, and because of this he gained the chance to become the protector of humanity, a person called the Guardian. Lee stared at the window without saying a word. Another message with a question that asked Lee if he is willing to accept this quest appeared. It prompted Lee to choose yes or no. At this point the angels had their hands all over Lee to coax him into accepting. With a determined look on his face Lee chose not to accept the quest. The angels couldn't believe that Lee was choosing not to accept the quest. They stared at him with a shocked expression on their faces. Lee received a prompt from the system asking him if he was sure he would like to decline. The system asked him to select carefully as he may not get another chance. Lee glared at the prompt. He knows that the Guardian Quest's pretext of protecting humanity is a good one, but in the end he will just become a part of a group. While the rewards will be guaranteed, his actions will be restricted periodically. And above all, a quest is merely a quest, humans however aren't so simple. If this quest is misused, then a guardian could turn into a villain in no time. Like humanity's worst traitor, Gordon Pracy, who started out as a guardian as well. Lee gritted his teeth, and in an annoyed tone he questioned how many times he would have to say it, and he declined the quest again. He turned his head to the right, and he saw that the angel with blonde hair was looking at him with a saddened expression. Then he turned his head to the left, and he saw that the angel with red hair was looking at him with an annoyed look on her face. The angels flew back into the gate, and shortly after the gate started to close, and Lee just stood there watching as the gate fully closed. Afterwards he motioned his hands towards the pile of bones, and he used metal control to bring a key towards him. After getting the key in his hands, he received a message from the system, congratulating him for winning the first rewards of the lucky event. And that reward was Akashic Armory Key Number 2. Lee observed the key as it hovered in his hand. This key is what the villain Jusip was searching for, and in order to get it Jusip was willing to slaughter innocent citizens. If it was the main quest reward, then Lee had no doubt in his mind that it's an object the villains needed. And in that case he was going to keep it, and screw over those villain fuckers big time in this life. As he exited the gate, Lee stored the key in his trench coat, with a grin on his face. At the temporary shelter, the guards and Minhee's team had arrived, and the guards were doing their best to calm the civilians down. The female guard that Lee saved reported to Manhu that a guard with a scar on his face told the citizens about the double gate. 
This didn't make any sense to Manhu, he addressed the civilians, saying he was the only guard with a scar on his face. The civilians were then asked to take a good look at Manhu's face so they could figure out if Manhu was the traitor. The civilians got a good look, and they came to the conclusion that it wasn't Manhu, but either way the fact still remains that the guards hid information about the double gate from them, and the civilians expressed that they didn't have any guarantee that the guards and military members won't use them as human shields. Li who was approaching heard everything. This annoyed him greatly, because even in death Juiciap is causing a commotion for him. When he tried to calm the situation down, he asked the civilians if they would be willing to trust him, the captain of the AMT rescue team. Seeing the rescue team made Lee smile because it confirmed Kangsyok didn't give up on Seoul Station until the very end in his previous life, and he sent Lieutenant Lee Minhee where he was needed at the perfect time. In response to Minhee, the civilians questioned why they should trust him. They couldn't trust the words of Minhee when the rescue team that was sent into the unlucky event was a team of just six people and they asked him to explain how he plans to perform the rescue operation. Minhi was taken aback by the pushback of the civilians and he couldn't respond. This angered them even more, and they all expressed that as the rescue team captain Minhi is supposed to have a plan. While still a distance away Lee shouted, asking for someone to explain what is going on here. And as he got closer, he continued shouting, questioning if the civilians understand that if the second wave starts then they were all going to end up dead. The civilians expressed to Lee that they couldn't trust the guards or rescue team anymore, which is the only reason why they were being this way. Lee glared at the civilians with an angry look on his face, and he asked them if they had another plan since they couldn't trust the military or the guards. The way Lee was speaking took the civilians, the guards, Minhi, Junmo, Sianha, and the rest of the rescue team by surprise. Lee continued on saying that the guards fought with their lives at stake to protect the civilians, and he questioned if that wasn't trustworthy enough. He asked the civilians if any of them would be willing to put their lives on the line to fight and protect the others. Finally the civilians were all quiet, they looked amongst themselves to see if anyone would be willing to step up. While this went on Minhee addressed Lee, he called him a rascal for talking to and treating the citizens this way. On top of that he demanded that Lee tell him where he was hiding all this time that he is only showing up now. Lee replied in a cold tone, telling him that he just blocked the double gate. This made Junmo happy, however Sianha, the civilians and some of the guards, except men who were left speechless. Minhee couldn't believe that Lee, an F rank blocked a double gate all on his own, and he expressed angrily that Lee must be lying. Lee glared at him with an irritable look on his face, saying the second wave will start soon, and he requested that the civilians hide as best as possible. Then he asked Minhee and the guards to follow him. Man who followed Lee's orders, and he ordered the other guard to help the civilians barricade the entrance with chairs and desks so they would be able to hide. Minhee was taken aback by Lee's commanding authority, and the fact that his own words, as the captain of the rescue team, meant nothing to anyone in this situation. This made him question if this really was the same Lee he knew. Sometime later, after all the civilians were in a safe place, Lee prepared to explain his plan to everyone, but before that Junmo approached, he handed Lee the cloud blade, and he handed Siana her spell book. Lee thanked Junmo, afterwards he addressed the others, he asked them to gather around him because he wanted to tell them something. After the guards and the rescue team gathered around him, Lee explained to them that the first wave spider monster wasn't mentioned in the field guide, and thanks to his metal skill and the guards force, they managed to stop the first wave. However Lee felt like it was still somewhat lacking for an unlucky event monster, man who agreed, saying that even though the spider monsters were formidable, it still felt kinda strange how easily Lee was able to handle it. Lee then expressed that he thinks he felt that way because it was the first wave. He explained that this is an unlucky event, and an unlucky event is also a kind of event, so he concluded that it must have stages. And during the second wave, he suspected that monsters that used the spider's characteristic, venom, might show up. Then he was still angry, not just Siana but the guards were listening so intensively to Lee. This made him question how he gained their trust. Since he suspected that venom would be a problem in the second wave Lee told the others to wear a gas mask beforehand. Lee also felt like no matter how big Seoul Station is, there was still a chance the civilians could be exposed to poisonous gas if it keeps spreading how he suspected it would. So he told the others that they have to lure the monsters from the second wave outside the platform at all costs. With all this out of the way, he decided to explain the details of how he plans to execute this operation to everyone present. Firstly, when the second wave starts, it is a must that they draw the attention of the monsters that appear and lure them outside, and Lee placed himself in charge of getting the monsters' attention. Secondly, the rescue team and the guards will wait outside in units, and they will attack the monsters lured outside from a spot where they can also take cover and hide in case of an emergency. Similar to the first wave, Lee explained that they simply need to bind the monsters' feet and bide their time. 
He expressed that no matter what, the others should not get close to the monsters. Then once they found a good fighting spot, and he ripped off the spider monster's armor, he wanted the others to focus on the part that had been exposed, and take down the monsters. Finally for the key part, for a higher chance of this operation's success, Minhee and Siana must lead them from a high position, and if Minhee continuously helps him teleport using the warp ability, Lee expressed that he can focus all of his mana and stamina into ripping off the armor of all the spider monsters that will appear. And if Siana continuously replenished Minhee's mana, then Lee suspected that they could use Minhee's warp ability till the end of the second wave. Above all, Lee expresses that there is only one person capable of recognizing and handling the risky situations of every unit, and that person is Minhee, who is well versed in raid tactics, which is why he was putting him and Siana in charge of leading them from a high vantage point. Lee's compliment made Minnie happy, to mask this he covered his mouth, and he spoke in a confident tone that this strategy wasn't bad, and he guessed that they should be able to get through without much damage. With a smile Lee expressed that they will be in Minhee's care then. Lee was confident that with the warp ability of Minhee, the sea ranker who's merely at level 15, they could easily complete this operation. The guards and the others quickly got into position, and as the second wave started, Lee approached the front line, announcing to the others that the second wave was starting, and telling everyone to get ready. A monster dropped from the gate, and its landing kicked up a gust of wind. Lee quickly covered his face, shielding his eyes from the debris that were sent flying by the wind. However, he kept one eye open so he could observe the monster. And as the dust settled, Lee could be seen with a menacing grin on his face. He couldn't wait to face the second wave, as he believed fully in the plan he made. However in that moment he received a message from the system reminding him that the only way to survive this unlucky event is to survive for 6 hours or defeat the boss monster. But for some reason this message placed an emphasis on the part about defeating the boss monster. Lee quickly realized what this meant, however he was in disbelief, he just couldn't accept the fact that fate would do him like this. But after the dust fully cleared, he could see the monster standing in front of him with a menacing aura, and to further confirm what he was thinking, he received a message from the system telling him the boss monster had appeared weird and shortly after he received another message telling him to defeat the boss monster. Lee quickly realized that the future had changed, he shouted for everyone to run with a distraught look on his face. Minnie couldn't understand what was happening, and he wanted to get a grip on the situation first, so he ordered everyone to stay put and hold their positions. He told the others that there would be no change in the raid plan, and that they must lure the monster away from the citizens. The boss monster took a look around, noticing the corpse of the spider monsters that came before it. This greatly angered it, it gritted its teeth, then it let out a roar that sent a shockwave throughout Soul Station. The roar of the monster was so loud that the others covered their ears in fear of bursting their eardrums. Lee glared at the boss monster and he gritted his teeth in annoyance. According to what he remembered from his previous life, the boss monster appeared after the second wave. This made him question if the future changed again because of him. In a rage the boss monster attacked Lee, and he quickly moved out of the way. After dodging the monster's attack Lee finally decided to get his act together, since if he didn't stop the boss monster it would mean annihilation. He reached forth his hand and he used Metal Smash, depleting his mana to 72%. However nothing happened to the boss monster, it just angered it further. Lee also received a warning from the system, informing him that the skill Metal Smash failed because the strength of the steel he tried to smash is higher than the force of Metal Smash. Lee couldn't believe it, he stared at the boss monster wondering what to do now that Metal Smash failed. As he thought about his next move, the boss monster attacked him. Luckily he was able to dodge using the body strengthening and metal control skill chain. So instead of hitting Lee, the monster's attack struck one of the pillars completely destroying it. Since the boss monster's attack was able to blow away the pillar, Lee concluded that even body strengthening wouldn't stand a chance. Again while he was distracted, the boss monster attacked him from behind. Lee took notice and this time he used the skill chain to spin himself out of harm's way, then he propelled himself towards the boss monster using the skill chain. Lee had a determined look on his face because he knew of only one way to get out of this, the chance of it succeeding is low, but it's the only way. As Lee got closer to the boss monster Min he called out to him calling him a maniac, and telling him to stick to their plan to lure the monster outside. Lee continued to charge forward, putting his faith in the fact that Minhee will soon catch on to his plan. In a flashback of Lee's previous life, we see him approaching Minhee after a recent mission. Lee addressed Minhee as tactical action officer, and after hearing his rank, Minhee turned around questioning if Lee is trying to make some excuse about his actions during this mission by calling him by his rank. 
Li thanked Minhee, because if it wasn't for his warp skill then he wouldn't have gotten out alive, and Minhee expressed in a cocky tone that that is the reason he is the tactical action officer. Li continued on saying he is happy to have Minhee as his partner, with a smile he expressed that Minhee has shown he wasn't bluffing when he said he memorized all the tactical manuals as an officer. Minhee tapped his forehead, and he told Li in a proud tone that memorizing books isn't all there is to actual battle tactics. He expressed that he has been letting those tactics age in his head so he can use it for later. Minhee continued on, and he explained to Lee that to get past his warp abilities limitation of the rear position, he needs to have every tactical detail down so he can use the warp skill at the right time and place. Lee was taken aback, and with a look of disbelief on his face, he questioned if Minhee really meant he memorized everything. Minhee pointed at himself and he spoke in a proud tone, saying every single tactic is a result of his struggle for survival. In the present Minhee observed Lee, trying to figure out what Lee is planning to do. Minhee and Siana continued to observe Lee as he led the monster around Soul Station in a ruckus. In the meantime, Lee's mana had depleted to 45%, and it was still rapidly decreasing because he was using the skill chain to dodge the rampaging boss monster's attacks. His mana reserve quickly depleted to 32%, however Lee continued to dodge the boss monster's attacks, holding out hope that Minhee, with his profound knowledge of tactics, will figure out what he is planning. As he continued to observe Lee, Minhee noticed that most of the boss monster's attacks ended up breaking pillars. Minhee finally realized that Lee wasn't just thoughtlessly dodging the attacks, he was directing all of the boss monster's attacks at the pillars. But even if Lee was able to take down all the pillars, then in the middle of that thought, he realized what Lee was planning. He took off his gas mask and gritted his teeth, then he turned to Siana and he asked her to give him as much mana as possible. Siana was confused, and she questioned why Minhee wanted that much mana. Minhee explained to her that he is going to create the biggest warp zone he can right now. Lee's mana had depleted to 27%, however the final pillar was in sight. As he was heading towards it he prayed his body would be able to hang in there. However the boss monster suddenly stopped, and it lifted both hands in the air, and it proceeded to strike the ground with all the force it could muster. The debris created from the boss monster striking the ground hit Lee in the back, sending him flying into the final pillar. Lee managed to catch himself on the pillar, however as he was getting his bearings he noticed the boss monster's leg heading towards him. Lee quickly activated the body strengthening skill on his upper half, and he braced himself for the attack. The boss monster's attack broke through the final pillar, and it sent Lee's body flying again. Lee's body crashed into a wall, he suffered great damage, however the final pillar holding up Soul Station was destroyed, and the building was starting to crumble. The boss still hadn't noticed that the building was starting to crumble, it approached Lee, preparing to end it. As the monster approached Lee realized that he needed to act as bait so the monster wouldn't figure out their plan. Using the wall, he slowly started to get his bearings to face the boss monster, Minnie who had realized what Lee was planning, finally got enough mana from Siana, and he shouted for Lee to move out of the way. A portal appeared below one of the boss monster's leg, and Minhee continued shouting that Lee would get swept up too once he activated his warp ability. Minhee did his best, but he was struggling to hold back his charged up power. Lee, who could barely speak, told Minhee that if he doesn't do it now, when the boss monster is still focused on him, then they will all die. Minhee knew deep down that Lee was right, however he still continued to hold his power back, but shortly after he released the skill with distraught look on his face. A giant portal appeared below the boss monster, causing it to lose its balance. It was then teleported to the lowest floor of Soul Station, where it crashed onto the floor. After getting its bearings the boss monster stood, and that area of the building had already started to crumble, and it rained down rocks on the boss monster. As that area of Soul Station crumbled, Lee could be seen with a grin on his face, he never lost faith in Minhee, and he knew Minhee would be able to do it. That area of the building collapsed. Then in a flashback of Lee's memories, we see him and Yuna looking over the corpses of the people that he had brought with him on a mission to defeat a monster. Lee expressed in a saddened tone that they had lost too many comrades in arms during this operation, and this was making him doubt whether he even deserves to be the leader. Seo Yuna turned her head towards Lee and she called his name. Then she asked him if he was going to keep up with this weak talk, she questioned who decides if someone deserves to lead, and she asked him if he still doesn't trust himself. Lee remained silent, he just turned his head sadly. In the present Lee's mana had been depleted to 3%, and the grin on his face suddenly disappeared. He started losing strength, and as he fell down, he apologized to everyone. As Lee fell, the memory from earlier continued to play in his head. Seo Yuna grabbed Lee's trench coat, and she called his name. Lee turned his head towards her, and there was a short pause as the two looked at each other. Shortly after, Seo Yuna expressed with a pleasant smile that Lee shouldn't bear all of this alone, and that if he gets uneasy he should look into the eyes of people around him, who he trusts. In the present, Lee heard Siana calling out to him. 
he opened his eyes and he saw Siana preparing to catch him and Minnie who was struggling to keep a portal open. Lee fell through the portal along with some debris and Siana tried to help pull him down quickly. After Lee was safely through the portal, Minnie closed the portal and Lee grabbed Siana and he rolled away from the falling rocks. Outside, a prompt had appeared above the black veil. The prompt stated that the boss monster had appeared, and that the people inside would have to eliminate the boss monster. There was about five hours left in this unlucky event, and after seeing the prompt, the AMT members started to panic. A soldier approached Kangsiok, and he reported that all media outlets are clamoring for a statement on the appearance of the boss monster, and they wanted to know which measures were being taken. While this was happening a man was seen hastily approaching Catherine in the background. Kangsok didn't know what to do, he scratched his head and gritted his teeth. The man that was approaching Catherine addressed her as Soul Attack Squad's department head, and he whispered in her ears, telling her that the director and the vice president said they wanted him to convey to Catherine that if this is how she was going to do things, then her position as the head of the attack squad won't last long either. This greatly annoyed Catherine. She raised her voice, expressing that these supposed brothers are fucking ambushing her like wild dogs. Because of how loud Catherine was screaming Kangsiok couldn't help but eavesdrop. Catherine continued on saying that she thought this was a load of crap. They were tearing her apart in unison as if they were waiting for this to happen. As she finished she noticed that Kangsiok had been eavesdropping, and as their two eyes met, Kangsiok started to glare at her. Catherine asked Kangsiok to stop glaring at her, and she expressed reluctantly that she would call someone who she referred to as him. Catherine took out her phone, and as she made the call she bit her nails, and she questioned why it had to be this person out of all people. As the phone rang, we see that the person she was calling was saved under her contacts as Crazy Dog. Inside the Black Veil, Siana started using her healing skill on Lee, and as she healed him, she asked him if he had a death wish or something. She expressed in a concerned tone that she thought he would die for real this time. Lee didn't respond, he glared at the ground, thinking about how the future had changed and how he could no longer gauge if the information he had about the future is accurate, or if it's all utterly useless now. Lee started to question what he should do. Siana saw Lee's face, and she grew more concerned. Then he saw Siana's face, and he became infuriated. He gritted his teeth, and he approached Lee, and he grabbed him by his collar. He called Lee an arrogant bastard, and he asked who Lee thinks he is, that he thought he could act all on his own. Minnie told Lee that without him every single person inside Soul Station would have been annihilated, including Lee, and he asked him if he knows this. Minnie continued on saying that tactics are based on promises, you're supposed to trust that your teammates will perform and follow the promised action at the promised time, this is the essence of all tactics. Minnie proceeded to ask Lee if he thought acting on his own for the sake of everyone else was a good thing, and he questioned if Lee had any trust in the people he called teammates in the first place. Minnie saying this made Lee recall a memory of Seo Yuna telling him to to have trust in the gazes of his friends once in a while. Siana turned to Minnie, and she raised her voice, expressing that this is not the time for this sort of thing. After remembering Seo Yuna's words, Lee gritted his teeth. Then he closed his eyes, and with a smile, he thanked Minhee, because thanks to him Lee thinks he knows what to do now. Minhee was taken aback by what Lee said, and he stared at him questioning what he meant. Lee explained that the boss monster will soon jump out of the pit it was in, but he just thought of a way they could deal with it. Minnie thought this was Lee's attempts to try and swoop in alone again, and he expressed that right now they have to be tactical. He tried proposing a tactic using Lee's metal skin, however Lee cut him off saying he planned on using electricity. With a smile he expressed that everyone needs to work together for this tactic to work. Then he turned to the others, and he shouted for everyone to listen carefully. He explained that from this point onwards, the core of the boss monster raid is Private Park Junmo. Junmo was shocked, he looked up at Lee questioning if he really just said his name. Outside, Kangsiok had decided to address the media outlets, but as soon as he took to the stage he was bombarded with statements. The reporters stated that they have information that the boss monster has appeared, and they questioned what will happen to the citizens of Seoul Station. They also demanded that the military and authorities make a statement. Kangsiok lowered his head, and with his hat covering his face, he explained that with the additional details confirmed at this time, they will be doing a briefing. He then expressed that just now the secondary rescue team of the unlucky event has been deployed. The reporters erupted. They questioned if Kangsiok sent in another low-level rescue team filled with hunters who are level 15 or lower when the boss monster had appeared. They asked Kangsiok if he plans to defeat the boss monster by deploying a lot of low-level personnel. Inside the Black Veil, the boss monster jumped out of the black pit it was teleported in. Afterwards it looked around for Lee. But after not seeing him, the boss monster became infuriated, and it let out a roar that was heard throughout Soul Station, and it created a shock wave. Lee, Siana, and the others quickly braced themselves, and as the boss monster continued to scream it looked up in the sky, and it noticed a giant water ball forming above its head. 
man who ordered his guard team to drop the water ball now, and his team quickly dropped the water ball on the boss monster. The boss monster was soaked, and it looked around with an irritable look. Lee then shouted for the guards to use the amplification rune. Two guards activated the rune, and they created a magic circle in front of Junmo as he was charging his electric skill. A short while later Lee shouted for Junmo to release the skill, and Junmo released the skill into the magic circle. Junmo's electric skill was amplified, and because the boss monster was wet, the attack was even more effective. The boss monster gritted its teeth as the electricity flowed through its body. Junmo continued to release his electric skill into the amplification circle. As he did this he called out to Lee to see if he could stop now. But Lee shouted for him to hold on until the frost rune was ready. Suddenly a voice echoed, telling them to stop moving. The guards, the rescue team members, Junmo, and even Lee instantly dropped to the ground. Outside the Black Veil, the news reporters continued to question Kangsyok about sending a second rescue team of what they thought to be low-level personnel to face the boss monster of an unlucky event. They asked him if he wasn't worried about the unnecessary casualties this will cause. Kangsyok replied in a serious tone, saying that this time the secondary rescue team consists of an S-rank hunter with no level restrictions, and that hunter was the Fist King Han Tisan, and the rescue team consisted of him alone. Inside the Black Veil, Han Tisan, ranked second in Korea and ninth in the world, nicknamed Fist King, cracked his knuckles in preparation to face off against the boss monster. Siana continued to heal Lee through Han Tisan's opening command, and Lee was slowly starting to recover. Since the future changed, and Lee couldn't fully trust the information he had about this gate, he was planning on doing the next best thing, which was to give up the reward for clearing the unlucky event and hang in there for the next five hours. With a grin, he thought to himself that this is the real authority of an S rank, and now he would no longer have to wait for the five hours to be up, since Han Tyson showed up just in time. Tyson approached the boss monster carrying a duffel bag. He expressed to the others that he would be taking over from now on, and that they could get some rest, or just get lost. They could even go home for all he cared. Lee continued to observe Tyson closely. In his previous life Tyson, as an S-rank player without any level restrictions, was able to clear this unlucky event because he was deployed at the last minute. Also the unlucky event clearing reward led to him being called the undefeatable fighter. The item he got his hands on was a secret item called Manon and Mackler's secret armor. After getting close to the monster, Tyson dropped his duffel bag on the ground, and he took out two shield-like weapons, and he warned the others that he doesn't like eating on the same table, and if he catches them drooling at his prey, then they're fucking dead. Lee's grin grew, and he thanked Tyson, because now he wouldn't have to give up on the unlucky event reward. However, as for the item that made Tyson famous, he would be eating it. He glared at Tyson with his signature grin, saying he is sorry to tell Tyson this but Tyson was the one at his table, aiming for his prey. The boss monster attacked Tyson however Tyson blocked its attack with ease. With a smile, he made note of the fact that the boss monster seems to know how to fight, and he expressed that he can fight as well. He activated a skill that sent the boss monster flying, and it crashed into a wall. Tyson's attack created a gust of wind that the guards and the AMT members had to brace themselves for. The boss monster quickly recovered from Tyson's attack. This surprised Tyson, and he expressed that the monster was sturdier than he expected. And as he jumped at the monster he told it that it was making him unnecessarily competitive. Tyson propelled himself forwards at incredible speeds using a flame skill, then he struck the boss monster. This attack cracked some of the armor on the boss monster's body and it left the monster disoriented. While the boss monster was still recovering, Tyson quickly jumped at it again. He pulled back his fist, and as he charged up an attack, Tyson told the boss monster that it was just making things worse for itself. He released the skill he was charging up, and he punched the boss monster right on the jaw. The boss monster stumbled back, and again the force of the attack caused the others to brace for the impact. Afterwards, Lee stood, preparing himself to jump in as well. Siana stopped him. She grabbed hold of his arm, and she expressed that for the last few moments Lee insisted she filled him up with some mana, which made her question if he would be okay, since right now Lee's treatment should be the most important thing. Lee smiled at her, and he told her that he was fine, and he expressed that Siana had nothing to worry about, since he wouldn't be using his body. This confused Siana, however in her confusion Lee quickly ripped his arm away from her, and he jumped down to claim his reward. As Lee jumped down Min he called out to him, asking what type of trick he planned on pulling now. Back to the battle, Tyson was having a blast using the boss monster as a punching bag. After Tyson's barrage of punches the boss monster's armor now had cracks in it. But as the boss monster fell back, Tyson noticed something strange. In between the cracks that were left on the boss monster after his attack, Tyson began to notice sparks of electricity. And suddenly the boss monster's chest burst open. 
Tyson jumped back to observe the situation. However, besides him now was Lee, and as the boss monster wallowed in pain, Tyson turned his head to Lee and he asked him if he had a death wish. Tyson expressed with an irritable look that he warned them not to drool at his table. Lee also faced Tyson, and he expressed in an annoyed tone that even for an S-ranker, Tyson was being a bit too unethical in his trades. This infuriated Tyson, and he asked Lee to repeat what he just said. Lee stood on business, he told Tyson that he was the one who interrupted their raid. Tyson couldn't believe the yap that was coming out of Lee's mouth. He questioned if Lee was saying that they could have killed the boss monster without his help, and he called him an arrogant lunatic. After he finished talking Tyson noticed Lee's cloud blade heading for the boss monster. He quickly took off, and as he ran he looked back at Lee and he called him a loser for playing dirty tricks. Tyson started to catch up to the cloud blade, so Lee grabbed his other hand to infuse more mana into controlling the cloud blade's speed. He shouted that they were the ones who endured until the fatal crisis point passed. But here was Tyson trying to swoop in at the last minute, acting like he was a hero. Lee expressed that there is no damn way he would let Tyson steal this from him. Tyson's speed increased, and they were now almost neck and neck. As they neared the boss, Tyson shouted, and he pulled back his right fist, and he began charging up an attack. Lee also shouted as he infused every bit of mana he had remaining into the Cloud Blade. The Cloud Blade and Tyson both struck the monster almost simultaneously. The boss monster fell back, and it exploded. Lee quickly braced himself, he covered his face, and he stood his ground through the shockwave created by the explosion. Outside, the black veil and the prompt hovering above it slowly started to disappear. As the gate disappeared the reporters that had gathered took notice, and they started reporting that the boss monster was defeated in less than five minutes after Fist King, Han Tyson entered. The event dome was disappearing, and with a loud boom the quest was cleared. As more of the Black Veil disappeared, the reporters could see the sorry state of which Soul Station remained, and they reported that it was now visible for everyone to see. They stated that this situation looked so dire that they cannot guarantee the survival of the citizens. Suddenly hundreds of citizens came running out of Soul Station, and the reporters broadcasted this. The daughter who was separated from her mother earlier quickly rushed towards her with open arms after seeing her in the crowd. The daughter grabbed her mom by the shoulders, questioning if she was okay or if she had been hurt anywhere. The mother hugged her daughter and she apologized for making her worry, and she expressed that she was fine. The daughter started crying and the two shared an embrace. The reporter captured this scene and it made headlines as breaking news. On a news broadcasting channel, a news presenter presented the news to the public, saying a miracle had occurred. All of the people in Seoul Station survived. He repeated this again. At the site where the boss fight happened, a message from the system appeared, and it congratulated everyone for surviving the unlucky event. And the message explained that lucky rewards will come to those who survived terrible misfortune. In a small print, the message stated that the ones who survived would be ranked, and their rank will be determined by their contribution to the event. Rewards will be awarded accordingly. Tyson received a message from the system congratulating him for ranking second, and it informed him that his lucky reward for assisting in the defeat of the boss monster would be given to him shortly. Tyson glared at the message, infuriated by what he just read. Lee's cloud blade was still stuck in the boss monster. Lee received a message from the system, telling him that an unknown energy is imbuing the cloud blade. The cloud blade was 24% done being imbued. Lee received another message that congratulated him on ranking first, and he was informed that his lucky reward for defeating the boss monster will be given to him shortly. Suddenly a necklace appeared in front of Lee, and Lee collected the necklace. As soon as the necklace was in hand, Lee received another message congratulating him on obtaining Manon and Mackler's secret armor. A hero-grade item with the trait to level up through battle, and when infused with mana it creates a thin layer of transparent armor over the user's skin, making this secret armor good for carrying and storing. Lee gripped the necklace in his hand tightly and he grinned. In this life he protected Soul Station and he got what he wanted as well. Tyson, who was fuming, called Lee a cheeky bastard and he asked him to explain himself. He also demanded Lee give him his reward. With his back turned to Tyson, Lee quickly slurped the necklace in his mouth. Afterwards he turned to Tyson and with a serious expression on his face, he questioned what Tyson meant by his reward. He explained that they were the ones who stopped the second wave and the boss and he told Tyson that he should be thankful for getting second rank despite butting in at the last minute. Lee expressed that Tyson can persist all he wants but that wouldn't change the truth. Tyson asked Lee in a furious tone if he would have to lecture him on the system. Tyson approached Lee with flames emitting from his body, and as he approached, he explained that slaying the boss monster takes up 70% of the contribution to the event reward, which means no matter what shit Lee and his team pulled off earlier, Tyson expressed that his contribution would have still been higher. 
He glared at Lee with a murderous gaze, and he says he was in the middle of a six-month isolated training when he had to run over to this mess, so for his troubles he needs at least a hero-grade item to balance things out. While still glaring at Lee with a murderous gaze, he asked Lee how he plans on making up for his reward. Lee couldn't help but grin. Here was Tyson arguing about his wasted time and compensation in front of him, who had to return to the military and was forced once again to do bullshit labor. Lee's silence further agitated Tyson. The aura he was releasing increased. He glared at Lee, questioning if he knew whose time he dared to waste. Lee called Tyson out, interrupting his monologue about how angry he was, and he asked him to stay in line. Tyson was taken aback by how brazen Lee was acting towards him, an S rank. Lee continued on saying that Tyson can spit all the bullshit he wants about his solitary training and his contribution, because it didn't matter to him. Looking back on his days in the military in his previous life, Lee expressed with an agitated look that if he had to be compensated fairly for all the time he spent fighting, then no reward would ever be enough. Tyson's eyes widened. He rushed at Lee calling him a fucking lunatic. Tyson attempted to punch Lee in the face and Lee braced himself, but suddenly Catherine's voice could be heard calling out to Tyson. Tyson stopped his attack, he turned his head, with a shocked expression on his face, and he saw Catherine and Kang Siok running towards them. Lee also turned his head towards his superiors with a shocked expression. As they ran, Catherine asked Tyson to explain what he was trying to do right now. Kang Siok also addressed the two. In a serious tone he questioned what they were doing when the gate was already closed. Lee grinned, and he thought to himself that this was perfect timing. He grabbed Tyson's shield-like weapon, and he praised him for doing a good job. He expressed that it was an honor to meet the great tiger Mr. Han Tyson. Tyson was further surprised by how Lee was currently acting. He stared at him with a puzzled expression, and he tried to wrap his head around what was happening. Lee turned his back towards Tyson, and he told him that he will be going now, and as Catherine approached Tyson, Lee took off running. Lee ran to Kang Siok, and after coming face to face, Kang Siok asked him if he was okay. Lee saluted him, and he reported that he was okay. Tyson suddenly started shouting. He demanded that Lee get over here right now. Catherine interrupted, and she told him to stop this right now. She expressed that she doesn't know what is happening right now, or why Tyson seemed so agitated towards Lee. But she turned his attention to the news helicopter that was flying overhead, and she explained that the whole nation is currently watching. So if Tyson causes a ruckus right now it will be impossible for even the Blue Flower Guild to stop it from getting out. Tyson looked up at the news helicopters that were flying overhead, and he gritted his teeth in annoyance. It was then announced that the Brigadier General was coming. A portal gate started to open, and after the teleportation portal was fully open, Choi yung Chiao, the Brigadier General came flying through. As he levitated past he turned his attention to Catherine and Tyson, expressing that it was unusual for Tyson to stay after he cleared a raid. Tyson glared at him, however Choi ignored him. He took another look at the two and finally he acknowledged Catherine's presence. He asked her if there was a problem since she was still here. And Catherine replied saying there wasn't a problem, and she expressed that she was just glad the gate closed without any casualties. Choi winked at Catherine, and with a cheeky smile, he expressed that if it's the Blue Flower Guild, then there must be no problems. As he said this Choi emphasized the part about there being no problems. As Choi levitated away, Catherine looked at Choi with a distorted expression, and she thought to herself that he was a sly old man. Choi approached Kang Siok and Lee, and as he approached Kang Siok saluted him. Since Choi had levitated away far enough, Catherine turned to Tyson, and she asked him why Soul Station was in this condition. She was certain that their condition stated for Tyson to clear the gate without any second wave damage. Tyson gritted his teeth, and he turned his murderous gaze away from Catherine. Catherine pressed on, and she asked him if this means he can't clear a gate at this level without any damage being done to the building. Tyson scratched his head, he told Catherine that he wasn't responsible for Soul Station's current condition, and that he also didn't rank first in the raid. Catherine was confused, and she asked him to explain what he meant when he said he didn't rank first. Tyson didn't give an explanation, he turned around, giving Catherine his back, and he expressed that he fulfilled all of Catherine's conditions. Before he took off, he turned his head, and he glared at Catherine, saying she has to keep her promise since he fulfilled all of her conditions. Tyson quickly flew off, leaving Catherine in confusion. After the gust of wind that was kicked up by Tyson's takeoff cleared, Catherine looked up at the sky as Tyson moved further away, and she questioned to herself if Tyson, an S rank, really just told her that he didn't rank first in a mere level 15 unlucky event. Catherine couldn't wrap her head around this, and if Tyson wasn't the one who ranked first she questioned who did. Her attention was then drawn to Choi, Kang Siok, and Lee, because Choi screamed that the report Lee was giving didn't make sense. This sounded interesting so she started eavesdropping. Choi stated that Lee's military records specify that Lee could control up to 300 grams of metal, but Lee's report just now suggests that he could control way more than that. 
Catherine quickly recognized Lee as the soldier from the cobbled gate. This increased her interest in their conversation. Choi continued on saying that unless the records are wrong, there is no way Lee should be classified as an F rank. Hearing this shocked Catherine, she couldn't believe what she just heard. With a smile Choi expressed that Lee is an interesting fellow, and he asked Lee to walk with him while he gave a detailed debriefing. Catherine's head started to hurt as she was overloaded with surprises, she held her head, and she did her best to think of an explanation for what was happening here. As Lee and Choi walked, Lee shot a quick glance at Choi. Then he looked forward with a serious expression on his face. As he walked he thought to himself that he should be on high alert because Brigadier General Choi is not a man to be trifled with. Choi's powers warranted him the reputation of a tactical nuclear weapon. But other than his absurd power Choi is remarkably clever as well. Choi was also the one the necromancer was most wary of in his previous life, and back then the necromancer even attempted several assassination attempts on Choi. As the two walked in silence, Choi spoke suddenly, he called Lee's name, and after Lee replied, he asked him if he would care to report to him about what happened earlier. Lee stopped walking, and he turned to face Choi. This was exactly what he was expecting Choi to ask, and he guessed that Choi was suspecting his unusual activity in comparison to his recorded abilities. So he came up with a lie. He told Choi that not long ago, when he caught his second elite monster, his abilities instantly improved, and he received an achievement message saying, Dunce's Rebellion. He expressed that after this, instead of the 300 grams that was recorded, he could now control nearly 17 grams of metal, and he even gained a few new skills. Choi was suspicious, achievement systems are just as uncommon as quests. As Choi thought about what Lee just said, Lee observed him closely. The world cannot find out that an F rank can progress, at least not yet, and he prayed that Choi will believe his story. Choi grinned, he told Lee that if what he was saying was true, then, as Choi was saying this, Lee suddenly felt icky. Choi told Lee that if what he is saying is true then Lee can't be considered an F rank, and he questioned if Lee's actual combat ability was at C rank, or if it was above that. Lee was shocked, he wondered if Choi would join the others who were trying to scout him. With a smile Choi praised Lee for doing a fantastic job, and he expressed that Lee should be rewarded for such a fantastic job. He asked Lee if there was an item he wanted, or maybe some magic armor, or anything else, if Lee asked he would do his best to give it to him. Lee lowered his head, he felt relieved that another high-ranking figure wouldn't join in the fight to scout him. And since Choi said he could ask for anything, he lifted his head slightly, and with his signature grin, he expressed that there was a weapon he wanted. But it's just that he doesn't think even a brigadier general like Choi could give it to him. Choi chuckled a little, and with a pleasant expression he asked Lee to give him the name of this item, which even a brigadier general wouldn't be able to give as a reward. Lee expressed that it was one of Choi's treasured items, the hero rank item, Fail Not. Choi was shocked, he couldn't contain himself, and he burst out laughing. As he laughed his ass off, he says Lee got guts of steel, and after getting his composure, he gave Lee a light punch on his chest, and he expressed that Lee was great. He said that they should have a chat about the weapon once Lee gets another badge. He faced forward, expressing that for now Lee will get a special promotion as his reward, Lee thanked Choi. And as Choi levitated away he expressed that Lee was a lively lad. Lee looked onwards with a slightly disappointed expression as Choi levitated away. As he expected of that old chameleon, the moment the hero rank item was mentioned Choi changed the subject in an instant. But Lee still felt relieved because he would be able to keep his ability to grow stronger hidden for a while longer. A few days later at the 3rd MT Brigade, in the 1st Battalion building, Lee received an update on the digestion of the Manon and Mackler's secret armor. The item was being digested with the Vivo Furnace running at 150% efficiency, and there was 16 hours 20 minutes left to go until the item was fully absorbed. Lee laid in bed staring at the message that had appeared, he was annoyed that it was taking so long but he thought to himself that he should have expected that a hero-ranked item would be hard to digest. Suddenly Junmo stuck his face through the message, and he asked Lee if they weren't going to train. Private Choi Minya, an E-rank with the chaser trait, begged Lee to get them to do something other than PT. Lee lifted his shirt, and he showed them his injury, which had been wrapped, and he asked them if they couldn't see that he was a patient right now. Private Choi Tiong, an E-rank hunter with the sniper trait, told Lee that he could just coach them at the front. Private Kim Kyunjin, an E-rank hunter with the thief trait added that they would follow closely behind Lee. And Private Park Sungmo, an E-rank hunter with the shaman trait, brought his hands together and he agreed with Ti Young and Kyunjin. Lee observed them, and he thought to himself that he gained something from this chain of events. He recalled everything that had happened to him after he regressed so far, and he noted that what he gained was trust in his teammates. But in the near future a wave will sweep across Seoul. A wave is a phenomenon where multiple gates explosively appear within a specific area. This wave will turn the city into a living hell, and the only one who knows that this will happen in the future is Lee. 
he thought to himself, questioning if he would be able to stop this wave by himself, and if these guys could survive amidst it all. He thought back to those memories, and it made him realize that for sure this time, he couldn't do it alone, and he would need everyone's help. Suddenly a soldier entered the room, the soldier introduced himself as Private On Minty, and he explained that he came after receiving orders to return to the support squad from the military general hospital. He saluted Lee, and he expressed that he is reporting for duty. Lee got up from his bed, and he started approaching Minty. As he approached he thought to himself that while future rewards are important, he has come to realize that there are more important things around him. He hugged Minty, and he thanked him. Confused, Minty asked Lee what he was thanking him for. Lee told him that he thanked him for coming right on time for training. This further confused the flustered Minty, and he asked Lee to say it one more time, as he didn't hear what he just said. Lee smiled and he expressed that he wouldn't repeat himself since Minty heard the first time. Lee thought to himself, thinking that these guys who are by his side must get stronger, since that is the only way he could save them all. He grabbed Minty, and as they made their way outside to train, they all exclaimed happily that it was training time. When they arrived at the training center, Junmo with a distraught look on his face told Lee that C-Ranks and Lower aren't allowed to use this training center, and he expressed that trivial people like them can't train here. Lee grabbed Junmo by the neck, saying they were the ones who wanted to experience some real training. Junmo accepted that they did ask for real training, but he questioned how Lee could start them out with this of all things. Lee was starting to get annoyed, he threw Junmo on the ground, and he reminded them that they cleared the unlucky event, so based on that they have no reason to be so intimidated. He expressed that all of them except Junmo leveled up as well. Junmo spoke for himself, as well as the others. He told Lee that during the mission they were just backups, but this training is something they would have to do on their own. Lee looked down at Junmo, and he told him that since this was the case, he would act as their backup. Hearing this made Junmo and the others excited. But as they approached the doors to the training center, the doors suddenly opened, further terrifying them. Lee pushed them in, exclaiming that they needed to get in quickly. After they were all in, Lee smiled, and he quickly closed the door to the training center. Junmo and the others started beating on the door, and they begged Lee to let them out, however Lee stood in front of the door, ensuring that they wouldn't be able to open it. As they cried for help Lee grinned, his teammate's attribute training begins now. Some time later, Lee was seen in the cafeteria. A female soldier, who was eating lunch with her friend noticed Lee, and she whispered to her friend saying that's the corporal uncle. Confused, her friend asked who the corporal uncle was, and the lady whispered in her friend's ear, explaining that Lee is the F-rank uncle who hard carried the blockade operation, and the unlucky event. The one with dirty blonde hair was shocked, and as Lee looked through what was available in the cafeteria, she expressed that she thought he would be a real burly-looking guy. But to her surprise this was not the case at all. Lee continued to look around the cafeteria for something that would cheer up Junmo and the others after their training. Suddenly his ears became itchy, and as he itched his ears he questioned why they suddenly became itchy. The scene then shifts to Seo Yuna, who was inside the cafeteria as well. Seo Yuna was talking to a male and a female soldier, and she told them to purchase as many things as the number of workers deployed in each company. Then as the soldiers that she was talking to walked off to carry out her order, she noticed Lee. She called his name, and she asked him if it wasn't time for personal training. Lee saluted her, and he expressed that he came here to the PX for energy supplements for his subordinates who are training right now. Sangok, who was one of the two soldiers Seo Yuna was talking to, glared at Lee as he was walking by. Lee shifted his gaze towards Sangok slightly, but he acted ignorant to the situation, and he thought to himself, questioning if Sangok was planning on starting something again. As the female soldier accompanying Sangok walked by she also stared at Lee, Lee noticed, but he struggled to remember if he had seen her before. Seo Yuna told Lee that she heard he received the Dunce's Rebellion achievement. Lee lowered his hand, and he brought them to his side, he told Seo Yuna that that was indeed correct. Seo Yuna expressed that the report was convincing about Lee's abnormal feet. She approached Lee, and as she approached she expressed her suspicion towards him. Seo Yuna exclaimed that he was hiding something else. Lee asked what she thinks he could be hiding, and Seo Yuna explained in a serious tone that Lee acts strange at times, as if he already knows what will happen, as if he had intel that they don't, or maybe some other aim. Lee was taken aback, since Seo Yuna was saying all this he questioned if she knew something. He told Seo Yuna that he wasn't sure what she meant by that. Suddenly they were interrupted by Sanguk saying he would tell the female soldier nothing. Lee and Seo Yuna turned their heads towards Sanguk and the female soldier, and they saw Sanguk with his hands up. Sanguk swore to the female soldier, Kim Sehi, that he didn't say anything, however she was still suspicious. Sehi started activating a skill, and she expressed that that was what Sergeant O said as well. She stopped the activation of her skill, after noticing that Lee and Seo Yuna were watching them. Suddenly it was broadcasted that Lee should report to the battalion commander's office immediately, because the battalion commander had called for him. 
After the broadcast, Seo Yuna expressed her dissatisfaction with this timing, and with a serious expression on her face, she told Lee that he better not forget their conversation today. She expressed in a serious tone that she might not know what he is after, but she will be watching him. Afterwards, she told Lee that he could leave. Lee saluted her once more, and as he left he wished her a good day. After exiting the cafeteria building, Lee felt relieved that he made it out of there. He decided to steer clear out of the way of that bull-headed Seo Yuna for the time being. Lee's attention was suddenly drawn somewhere else, he questioned why the battalion commander was calling for him. It couldn't be the promotion ceremony because that was still a few days away. He made his way to Kang Siok's office, and as he approached, he heard Kang Siok's voice expressing that someone can't call this a test. Lee approached the door to Kang Siok's office, and as he knocked, Kang Siok continued on shouting that if this person sends them there, then all of his men will die. Lee was heard knocking, so Kang Siok told him to enter. Lee entered, and with a salute he expressed that he was here to report after being called. However, as he finished saying this, his mouth opened, and he gasped. To his surprise Choi was also in Kang Siok's office. Choi turned to Lee, acknowledging that he was here. Kang Siok was about to explain why Lee was called to his office, but Choi cut him off saying he would explain it to Lee instead. Suddenly his expression changed, and in a serious tone, he told Lee that a few days ago a red gate opened in the Shinram area. The Blue Flower Guild had the raid rights for it, but the annihilation of the Blue Flower Guild's third raid squad was confirmed as of today, and the gate has been declared Trouble Rank 3. Trouble Rank 3. After three unsuccessful attempts to raid the gate, the organization is deemed to be lacking in capabilities, and two or more organizations will be required for a joint response. Lee was shocked. He doesn't remember an incident like this happening in his previous life. Choi explained to Lee that the gate has an entry limit of level 18 or lower, and a 30 hunter limit. Choi then explained that he was told that it's a zombie dungeon, and once entered it was impossible to leave until the raid was successfully cleared. Hearing that the gate was a zombie dungeon made Lee think about the necromancer. With a distraught look on his face he thought to himself, questioning if the necromancer could be behind this. Choi expressed to Lee that the Blue Flower Guild sacrificed a bunch of their talented rookies and still failed the raid. He told Lee that dungeon raiding is a guild affair, so their troops don't necessarily need to step up. But with a grin he expressed that he thinks Lee is the right man for the job. Kang Siok called Choi, but Choi just glared at him. This made Kang Siok realize that Choi was serious about this. Kang Siok turned to Lee, and he asked him if he thinks he can do this. Lee thought about it for a moment, this didn't happen in his previous life, but that's besides the case, if it's zombies, it could be related to the necromancer, meaning he has to be the one to raid this gate. With a serious expression on his face, Lee replied saying he would give the red gate a shot. Kang Siok was shocked, however Choi expected this as he already concluded that Lee had guts of steel. Even though Lee agreed to give the red gate a shot, he wanted something for his troubles. He expressed that he doesn't think he can take on the red gate with the weapons he had. With a grin he reminded Choi about Fail Not, the item he talked about last time, and he said if Choi gives it to him, he would make sure to succeed at the raid. Fail Not is a one-shot arrow that never misses, it was used by Sir Tristan, a character that appeared in The Legend of King Arthur. Despite its incredible accuracy and magic nullifying effects, the arrow is difficult to retrieve, meaning it can only be used as a weapon once. So even in Choi's hands, it's a treasured weapon that's like a last resort. But in the hands of someone like Lee, who controls metal, it's a whole different story. Choi was taken aback by how brazen Lee was, he grinned, and he expressed that the weapon will make it a deal, not a favor, and Lee will have to bear the full brunt of the risk if he fails. With his signature grin, Lee expressed that he was fine with this, since after all high risk bets usually have a big payoff. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video then hit the like button.